Uh, welcome to the January 12th, 2021 meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. Uh, clerk, please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig? Here. Friend? Here. Coonerty? Here. Caput? Here. Chair <clears throat> McPherson? Here. Uh, go ahead. Okay. Good morning and welcome to the teleconference January 12th, 2021 Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisor meeting. Pursuant to the provisions of the governor's executive order N2920, this meeting is being held virtually. The county welcomes the public to participate in today's meeting using the Zoom link provided on our website at www.santacruzcountyca.iqm2.com. Click on today's date and then the agenda. You will find the Zoom link there, or you may type it in as you see it here on the screen. If you wish to participate by phone, you may do so by calling 1-669-900 six eight three three the meeting id is eight two one three eight eight four one one zero three again you may call one six six nine nine hundred sixty eight thirty three and enter the meeting id eight two one three eight eight four one one zero three. If you need further help logging into today's meeting, you may call the clerk of the board's office at 831-454-2323 and someone can help you log into the meeting. As always, you may watch the live stream broadcast of today's meeting through www.santacruzcountyca.iqm2.com, the county Facebook page, or through the community TV website. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, and thank you. I just want to thank the general public for its patience and understanding of our situation uh, going uh, by Zoom and virtual as as other uh, city in the county of Santa Cruz. Um, I would Before we have a moment of silence, I'd like to call on Supervisor Ryan Coonerty. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just briefly wanted to take a moment and uh, acknowledge the events of last week uh, when we saw terrorists storm our U.S. Capitol in order to block uh, accounting of uh, electoral votes in a free and fair election. Um, I want to just take a moment to recognize a couple things. One is, um, you know, uh, a lot of focus has been put on the elected officials who were put in harm's way, but there were uh, staff and then obviously Capitol Police um, who bear the brunt uh, of the attack both last week, but just in general with the denigration of civic life and I want to take a moment and thank um, all the county staff who uh, interact with constituents all the time. Um, and we live in a very, um, at times, toxic and, and scary uh, atmosphere. And I just want to appreciate the county staff who continue to uh, serve the public, um, even through um, what, is a, what is a extremely difficult environment. The second piece is just to recommit ourselves um, to democratic uh, norms and laws, and that uh, we will uh, do our best to ensure that uh, we rebuild sort of American governance and democracy from the ground up um, through our commitment here at the local level. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you and well said. And, and I might just add too that uh, I can't think of any time that uh, in my period of public service that there, we've had more intense political atmosphere, uh, just carry, you know, the COVID and the fires and all in particular in this area. You know, I'd like to say a suggestion that uh, if you know somebody that's of a different party or for different thoughts that you have, go up and say, hello, uh, let's work this out. Let's, uh, let's get personal about it and do it at home and show the rest that uh, we know how to do this. Uh, it, it's really easy to really just keep the, the vent and anger going at one another. Let's try to reach out and just say, you know, uh, we're in a new moment now. Uh, we're gonna have new leadership in this nation and um, we, uh, we need to get together and work it out and uh, be civil about it. So uh, I, I just really urge everybody to, to make a, an effort 
to reach out and say hello to someone, maybe who, and in particular, if you, if they disagree with you and just say, you know, this is the way I feel. I know you feel this way, but we got to do it in a civil and, and, and safe manner. So thank you, Supervisor Ryan Poonery. I appreciate your comments. Um, now we will um, have a moment of silence before we have the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, we'll have the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. <laughs> for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I would like to um, welcome Supervisor Koenig. This is his first regular meeting. He was sworn in last week. Welcome to the County Board of Supervisors. Uh, item number three, the consideration of late additions uh, to the agenda and uh, or deletions to the consent and regular agenda. Do we have any, Mr. Palacios? Uh, yes, we do, Chair McPherson. Uh, on the regular agenda, item number nine, we have additional materials. I revised attachment A, packet pages 26 and 27. On the consent agenda, item number 33, there's additional materials. There's a revised memo packet page 292. Item number 34, there's additional materials. Revised attachment A, packet page 328. And then there's an addenda on the consent agenda. Uh, number 45.1, approve amendment to agreement with families in transition, reducing the total two-year amount to 4,000,009,205 for CalWORKs housing assistance and move-in program services. Approve the amendment to agreement with Watsonville Law Center, increasing the total two-year amount to 188,180 for legal assistance services. Approve an amendment to agreement with Community Action Board, increasing the total two-year amount to 1,785,000 $190 for CalWORKs emergency payment program services and take related actions as recommended by the Director of Human Services. There's a memo printout, there's contract uh, item A, amendment to families and trans transition, item B, amendment to community action board, item C, no, amendment to the Watsonville Law Center, center Zoom, so item D, uh, amendment to families in transition, Item E, the Watsonville Law Center, and item F, which is the Community Action Board. There's also an addenda 45.2. This is to approve an amendment to agreement with the Santa Cruz County Office of Education, increasing the amount by 15,700 in fiscal year 2021 for a new two year total of 356,575,000. dollars $575 to provide emergency child care bridge program services, approve the amendment to the agreement with the Parent Center for the Leaps and Bounds program to modify services provided to families with infants and take related actions as recommended by the board, by the Director of Human Services. There's a board memo printout. There's an amendment number two to the Santa Cruz County Office of Education. There's an amendment to Parent Center um, agreement, and then there's ADM 29 at 21 W450 4058, and then item D, which is ADM 29 21 W3909. That concludes the uh, additions to today's agenda. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Palacios. Um, now uh, we'll go to item number uh, five. Uh, this is the time for public comment any person may address the board once during the public comment not exceeding two minutes comments uh, must be directed uh, to items on today's consent or closed session agendas yet to be heard items on the regular agenda or on a topic not on today's agenda but within the jurisdiction of the board we'll take public comments now for up to 30 minutes uh, and if necessary additional time for public comments will be allowed after the last item on today's regular agenda uh, clerk, do we have any uh, com public comments that are 
coming in. We, we do, Chair, um, and if you will give me a minute, I will put up how people can join us. Very well, thank you. Okay, if you wish to comment and are joining us through the Zoom link, please find the hand icon on the bottom of your screen and click on the icon to raise your hand. This will place you in line to speak. When it's your turn to speak, I will call you by name and you will see a pop up on your screen asking if you want to be if you want to accept being unmuted. Please accept this and start speaking. Once you start, once you start, the timer will begin. If you are calling from a phone, please dial star nine now. This will virtually raise your hand. I will identify you by your last four digits of your phone. When you hear me say the last four digits, please, please dial star six to unmute yourself. Only dial this once. If you dial it a second time, you will remute yourself. Once you dial star six, you may start to speak and the timer will start when you begin. Okay. The um, first speaker has a private number. We cannot see you, but so if you have called in and your number is private, now would be your time to speak. <clears throat> now is your time to speak, speaker. Hi, this is Marilyn Garrett, I've been attending board meetings for over 20 years. You just at opening comments, Supervisor Kundi spoke about committing ourselves to democratic policies even before this uh, COVID crisis. I saw the board become less and less. Can I, why is the timer? Democratic, what, are you talking to the, me? I apologize, Speaker, please continue. Um, I notice this is the first time it says that public comment is limited to two minutes. The public has been more and more uh, excluded from any type of representational government, especially now. I'd like to refer people to a, uh, uh, let's see, it's called a Focus on Fauci event. Focus on Fauci, and you can watch it uh, via uh, globalresearch.ca, that stands for Canada, and it's an interview with Sasha Stone, David Martin, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., Rocco Galati, Dr. Judy Mikovic, and just to start this out, and then you can check it out, he, David Barton states on January 5th, let's make sure we are clear. This is not a vaccine. They are using the term vaccine to sneak this thing under public health exceptions. This is not a vaccine. This is an... Our next speaker your is a call in. And your telephone number ends in one nine nine nine. Please go ahead and unmute yourself and begin speaking. Yes, hello. Today is January 12, 2021. My name is James Ewing Whitman. Can I be heard? Yes, you can. Excellent. Why is telling the truth such a revolutionary act? I have never been so been one shy to not stand beside my work as a general contractor and also as a teacher that asks those I am sharing information with to provide any observations of my agendas back to me, allowing these individuals to interpret my words of instructions, whether on a job site, a playing field, a mountain cliff, 
or a dance floor, these individuals take my concepts and improve them often. But often we are educated into ignorance. Fiduciary trust. What does that mean? Fiduciary duty is a legal obligation of the highest degree for one party to act in the best interest of another. The party charged with this obligation is the fiduciary or the one that is entrusted to care of the property, money, health, and safety of others. With that, why are unelected members of the Community Foundation of Santa Cruz County entrusted with such fiduciary power? To understand the role that the tax-exempt foundations play today in USA Incorporated, the Cox Committee and Reese Committee's investigations by Congress in 1952 to 1955 provide invaluable insight into their workings. My observations, if that given opportunities like an exploratory recall committee, might expose that the Community Foundation of Santa Cruz County, currently being headed by Margaret Lopez and Susan True, control every action of this county and of the BOS and are funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation who follow the dictates of the World Health Organization and the Rothschilds cartels. So I'm politely asking the elected leaders and chosen leaders this. A mistake does not become an error unless you refuse to correct it. Thank you. Speak, speaker, Mr. Cabanis, you have two minutes to speak. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and start speaking. The timer will begin when you start. Good morning. My name is Shala Cabanis. Uh, I love Santa Cruz. I currently have the privilege of ser serving as chair to the Mental Health Advisory Board. I'd like to bring your attention to written correspondence. Every year, uh, the state puts together a um, uh, questions of what's going on locally. This year, the focus was on telecare. As we know, the need for behavioral health, uh, we have people who've needed um, support for the first time ever, and we have other people who need more acute uh, support. Uh, telecare takes uh, uh, support or comes in to help support with the more acute needs. Um, and you can see that in the report, um, again, in written correspondence. I uh, thank the supervisors for their service. And I would like to also point out that uh, Supervisor Caput comes to every meeting and is a wonderful support as well. Um, on a personal note, I do like so much how you are supporting the community, including showing um, leadership when it comes to supporting the people who support the community, like in the County Office of Education. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Monica McGuire. You have two minutes to speak. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and start speaking. The timer will start when you begin. Hi there, thank you so much. I too want to comment on what all the opening statements were by the supervisors because it's so interesting to hear you saying you want us to um, speak to people who have political differences. We keep asking you to respond to us, um, your employers, uh, the public is the employer group. If a large family hired someone and found out over time that everyone thought someone else was watching and seeing what they were doing, but realized no one was watching and that employee wasn't doing what they were supposed to do, it would be a big problem. Um, and that's what the, most counties have done and what this county has done clearly. Your opening comments, supervisors, about we should speak to someone with political differences, we wish you would just speak to us the public who take the time to show up at the meetings. And, and it was so refreshing last week that Manu responded to us. And in fact, um, uh, Mr. McPherson, you did, except that you, and I keep saying Manu because he's so much more a person than the rest of you are since you never respond to us when we're there. Um, and I'm just inviting you to please start treating us the way you're supposed to, where you can respond uh, if you choose and just don't throw off the agenda for the day. And you can always put on next week's agenda the really great ideas that the public brings to you and asks you to address. You don't have to say that the Brown Act prevents you from addressing us. So we apparently are different politically in your minds. And um, my goodness, uh, Ryan Coonerty, you seem to think that people here are dangerous with the way that you made opening comments, which is very strange. 
but what we have is the ability to pull together and act like community. And that's what we want you to do and to act like you care about what we say by responding to us appropriately. And it's so sad we have to repeat this statement over and over and over, but the public doesn't understand that you're not doing your job. So we're informing the public of that at the very least. The next speaker is Ms. Carol Bjorn. You have two minutes to speak. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and start speaking. The timer will begin when you start. Good morning, supervisors. This is Carol Bjorn. And I would like to echo the comments of the previous speakers. And I would also, again, uh, like to address what the opening comments by Supervisor Coonerty and uh, Chairman McPherson. Um, specifically, Chairman McPherson, I'm happy to take you up on your offer to sit at the table across from someone who has a different point of view. Um, because as Monica clearly said, we obviously have different points of view. I've been attending the uh, Board of Supervisor meeting since June, uh, bringing information and it's been wholly ignored. And um, so I'm happy to sit down with you in a Zoom meeting in person. We can do it safely. I'm happy to do that. And we could even coordinate with Monica and um, set up a time that works for all of us. I'd like to extend that invitation to all the supervisors and to Gail Newell and Carlos Palacios and Jason, um, the county council. Um, and then also I wanna speak to the comments by Supervisor Coonerty and McPherson, where you spoke about um, the toxic and scary atmosphere and the intense political atmosphere that we're experiencing. Um, part of it's because we haven't been communicating, number one, but two, in the communications that we've gotten from the government to us, um, there's been a lot of uh, misinformation, to, to say it lightly. Um, we're trying to get the truth out. Um, and that's what I try to do when I email you. I sent an email yesterday with truth. Um, there was a study done in Wuhan, China, and it was done in November of 2020. There is no asymptomatic transmission of COVID-19. When you realize that, you realize that all these governmental policies are not really about slowing the spread of COVID-19, they're about something else. And again, I'm happy to sit down at the table and talk to you. You have my email because I had to give you an email address to log on to this, um, to this meeting. Um, thank you for your time. Maria Ellen de la Garza, you are our next speaker. You will have two minutes to speak. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and begin speaking. The timer will begin when you start. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. This is Maria Elena, the Executive Director to the Community Action Board of Santa Cruz County. And I want to start off, and I'm speaking on item 27 on the consent agenda. I'd like to thank um, the Board of Supervisors, particularly uh, Supervisor Coonerty and Supervisor Caput, who have led us in um, uh, writing a letter to support farm workers being prioritized in distribution of vaccinations. And I wanna say that that, um, that was in important and critical work. Our governor um, did indeed um, uh, roll out vaccinations to support farm workers. But there are three items I'd like to stress in moving forward and next steps. Number one, asking the Board of Supervisors to support the creation of a cross-sector task force to ensure an equitable implementation plan for the vaccine and build upon efforts that may already exist and do already exist specifically in South County. Um, from what we learned from recent pandemic efforts, we need an intentional strategy that targets indigenous speaking communities, especially in Watsonville. Number two, resource trusted messengers. We're here, we're here to be of service. And I say we collectively, and we need resources to help move this education and outreach effort forward. And lastly, recognizing that people in our community, especially in Watsonville, are getting sick. We need to continue advocating for wage replacement and housing opportunities for those families most impacted by the virus. I wanna thank our county partners who have taken equity as an important priority in moving this forward, but we have more work to do and we're here to be your partners to help us move this forward um, with CAB and our thriving immigrant collaborative partners. Thank you very much. Thank you for all you do. Happy New Year. Our next speaker is Mr. Tony Cray. Or I'm sorry, Tony Crane. You will have two minutes to speak. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and begin speaking. The timer will begin when you start. Uh, hi, this is Tony Crane. Uh, a, uh, I live in Aptos, California. I have been 
attending meetings for about three and a half years, uh, starting uh, with an objection to uh, the second story peer respite program uh, crisis mental health facility that was put into our neighborhood uh, without going through proper legal channels uh, and process. Um, I uh, agree with everything um, that Supervisor Coonerty said. Uh, however, when it comes to uh, asking us to follow norms um, and laws, um, that's quite hypocritical uh, because I have brought to you over these this time period uh, irrefutable evidence that county and encompass employees lied to the public and committed fraud in order to put this program in the neighborhood. Uh, lied about what its real intent was and the emails that I received through uh, the request for public information clearly show that they were telling the public one thing but behind the scenes were, were acting and saying the exact opposite. Um, the Board of Supervisors has been aware of this and just simply refused to do what was right, which was simply give the community uh, the opportunity to have a public hearing, which it should have had from the beginning, a mental health facility that was intended to uh, house or not house, but uh, attend to hundreds of uh, uh, guests per year. And you didn't do it. So the hypocrisy is staggering. Um, and uh, just letting you know that uh, I'm not going away. Our next speaker is a telephone call in whose number ends in 2915. You have two minutes to speak. I am unmuting you. Please accept that unmute. When you begin speaking, the timer will start. Good morning. This is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Good morning and Happy New Year to you all. I um, attended a County Historic Resources Commission meeting yesterday and um, proposed that that commission work with the Board of Supervisors to really get information out to their constituents about a tax credit for historic preservation properties. This is a very, it's, it's a new piece of legislation with money available to help people who own historic properties to preserve them. It's a very uh, short window of activity that is possible, only five years, and the process for application takes some time. The commission did not act on my request, but I'm hoping that you as the board will uh, reach out to your historic resources commissioners and find out more about this and hold a town hall meeting for those in our county who own historic properties to get this very important and helpful um, financial assistance. I want to follow up on comments and very good discussion at the special meeting last Tuesday, and that was about the CZU fire evacuees being charged $900 to $950 a month to be able to stay at the county fairgrounds. I am hoping for a report back from staff very soon. I drove by there yesterday and noted there are even more RVs there. I don't know that they are all fire evacuees, but I would very much as a member of the public like um, a report about this. The county has a contract with the county fairgrounds to provide emergency shelter as needed. There is county-owned property in Watsonville behind the Ameline Health Services that was used for Chair, I do not see any more hands up for public speakers. We are completed with the public comment. Okay, um, we will uh, we'll continue with the, uh, the consent agenda. Uh, we'll any comments from the board on items on the consent agenda? Uh, Supervisor Koenig? Uh, you're on mute. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to uh, start by thanking uh, on item 24, thanking Tim Gordon for volunteering to serve as the new first district planning commissioner. Uh, as the founder of Workbench, a local design and build firm, he's 
uh, created some projects that are really exemplary and I know he'll bring the same standard of review uh, to other projects. I also want to thank Lisa Sheridan for volunteering to serve as the alternate first district planning commissioner. I'm sure that her experience with sustainable SoCal as well as a business owner and realtor will enable her to serve as a bridge for our, our community and help us all grow towards our values. Uh, on item 31, I'm honored to represent the county on AMBAG, the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments, uh, as we deal with the new uh, housing uh, quotas from the state and, and plan housing for our region. Uh, on item 35, I just wanna note that it's fantastic. We're adding 11 new residential treatment beds to address substance use disorder. Uh, and along with 33 items, 33 and 37, some significant increase in programs. And I look forward uh, to the presentation on the regular agenda that will include how it'll be evaluated. Um, and finally, I just wanna to point to item 39, uh, the county's contribution of $3.8 million to Second Harvest Food Bank demonstrates the extreme need in our community uh, and our commitment to address it. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Friend, Second District. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I would like to uh, thank my colleague, Supervisor Coonerty and Supervisor Caput for item 27. But I'd really like to echo the comments that were made by um, Ray Lana on, these, on this item. Uh, now that the state has prioritized uh, ag workers, I think that the real challenge is going to be ensuring that we can actually reach this very difficult uh, population in regards to actual vaccination. And I, I know that uh, Director Hall and I know that Dr. Newell have been working with the Farm Bureau and others on exactly this. And I really would like to thank them as well for that. But this is going to be a real challenge. It's been clear that even people that have a lot of access to information and are very, uh, very much participate generally in processes still don't actually understand vaccine priority or how to obtain access. So there's going to be uh, communities that are the most hit currently, the most disadvantaged language barriers uh, and, and others that are going to really need a lot of help, not just from the county, but uh, other advocacy organizations that do that outreach. So I think the second part of, of item 27 is now that the prioritization has been reached, uh, how do we ensure that actually it, it, it gets distributed in a, in a real fashion down, especially in the South County. I'd also just like to thank um, County planning staff for its continued work on the vacation rental modifications. I know that uh, the Coastal Commission is is uh, hearing that as we speak, or just did, and, and uh, is gonna have some modifications to send back to us. But overall, the basic framework of what we created appears to be something that Coastal is supporting. And I think that these changes to the vacation rental ordinance really will not just improve neighborhoods, but also help on the greater housing stock within our county. So I just wanted to thank the work of the planning department on those items. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Coonerty. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a couple items to comment on in one additional direction. First on item number 20, which is the remote work policy at the county. I, I just wanna take a moment and appreciate that uh, the county is using this opportunity to really rethink how we uh, structure work in a way that I think benefits not only the workers, uh, but uh, people using county services, as well as the taxpayers. And I wanna appreciate um, that effort going forward. Item number 27, I wanna thank uh, Supervisor Caput for joining me on this farm worker, uh, urging the state to prioritize farm workers in a way, uh, in the equitable way that Maria Elena uh, de Garza outlined. And I wanna thank the community that's doing really good work out there to make sure um, that uh, these uh, folks who are providing a vital service are getting the um, are getting the support they need um, in a in a difficult environment, and uh, we need to do better. Uh, and one of the best ways to do it is to make sure that they get the priority for the vaccine um, that they they've earned as essential workers in this uh, during this this pandemic. Uh, and then finally, uh, on item number 37, which is uh, the hub and spoke program for uh, medicated assisted treatment. Um, I think uh, MAT treatment is probably uh, one of the best, is for sure one of the best strategies uh, we have to increase, uh, to, to address the crisis that we have in our community of uh, substance use and the, and, the, and the impacts that follow it. Um, in support of uh, 
of both the, this item and the operational plan objective 63, which is to increase match services by 75% to more than 230 unique patients. Um, I'd like to add direction that the staff uh, collect data and outcomes on the hub and spoke program and report back to the board during the June 2021 update on the operational plan. Uh, I'd like to include in this report back on how many clients are served by the program, how long they receive math services, and um, and in addition, uh, if that how many people are uh, turned away, uh, or if there's a waiting list for this service. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Caput. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I will make a comment uh, concerning the uh, RVs at the uh, fairgrounds. Uh, as of Saturday, uh, this past Saturday, the 9th of January, uh, there were 13 households from the fire shelter uh, residing at the fairgrounds in RVs. Uh, one, uh, three of the households are getting financial uh, assistance for the monthly fee through the county under COVID response and additional households will be covered uh, by January 20, uh, 9, uh, 2021. Uh, one of the RVs uh, said that they are going to be moving out of state within the next two weeks. And one is awaiting a Section 8 voucher uh, to get housing. One is waiting to be allowed back on his property and is getting financial assistance. And five households have been able to, have been unable to document uh, their addresses so that they were within the burn area and uh, they may have been pre-disaster homeless or are living in a very non-conventional arrangement. So anyway, we're, we're looking into that and we're trying to help uh, all the people out there as best we can. And there are uh, people living in RVs at the fairgrounds on a regular basis that come and go. Uh, they're either uh, traveling or whatever. So that accounts for a, a certain number of RVs that are being seen out at the fairgrounds. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. Um, I'd like to address a few issues on, on item number 18, the legislative priorities. I want to thank the CAO's office for putting this together in coordination with uh, the supervisor's offices and the departments. Uh, and I'd like to hi highlight three priorities in particular that are just very pressing for us, of course. The COVID relief, uh, fire recover, uh, recovery and disaster resilience, and homelessness. Um, these are the most pressing issues for us right now, and they, uh, they're, way, they're way bigger than we can uh, support with our local financial resources. Uh, also, I'd like to mention that uh, in the governor's uh, budget, uh, those three uh, items were mentioned, as well as one that's been very much of uh, interest to this county uh, to implement uh, the state's first master plan for aging. Uh, the governor has proposed uh, allocating uh, millions of dollars for that purpose. Uh, it's very much needed uh, in this county and throughout the state of California. Uh, of course, this will go through the budgetary process uh, that won't be decided until June by, in Sacramento. Um, I need that. I think that uh, we've stretched our staff on the COVID issue uh, to the maximum while initiating furloughs at the same time and tapping reserves uh, that really. Um, reduces our, our reserve that, that we have in our budget. Uh, we need support from uh, funding from, uh, the, uh, from our nation's capital expressly uh, for state and local governments. Um, on recovery and resilience, uh, we need a greater support for vegetation management, code enforcement, and a stronger oversight of PG&E. Uh, and lastly, I think we can see our community uh, on any given night, we need more funding to uh, create lasting solutions to homelessness through uh, prevention, diversion, housing, and mental health and substance abuse treatment. And we're working with the city to try to do the best, the cities to do the best we can with that. 
Uh, I'd also like to comment on item number 20, which was mentioned by uh, Supervisor uh, Clarity uh, about the remote, remote um, work policy. I just have a question that uh, this does not do, need to be pulled from the consent agenda. Um, how, how will this policy be amended uh, when we were going through, when we are through with the uh, COVID uh, uh, pandemic, or at least back at a time when there's a minimal community spread? Can employees expect to still have the option to work from home or at, uh, at least some of the time? Or how are we working on that? I just want a general uh, answer if I could on that. Yes, um, Supervisor McPherson, or Chair McPherson rather. Uh, we do intend to continue uh, to emphasize the ability to work remotely. We think there's a lot of advantages, both uh, from re reducing the amount of commuters, reducing our parking issues, improving quality of life, improving morale. There's just, uh, there's just a number of pluses to, to uh, remote work. And so as the COVID uh, crisis subsides, we intend to continue to uh, allow remote work um, according to how each department is managed. So we will be revising the remote work policies okay. once the COVID crisis is over and then make it more of a permanent uh, policy in our personnel reg regulations and rules. Good. I think that can be beneficial in more ways than one for the employees, for environment uh, going down the line. So thank you. I, uh, I'm going to come back to item number 30. Uh, I also want to get to the uh, number item number 31, uh, commission and committee appointments. We've just uh, uh, recognized some new ones, uh, and we've uh, for the board assignments on committees and commissions. We have more than uh, 40 commissions and committees uh, in the county. And I just want to say to those who serve on those commissions and committees, thank you very much for your service. Uh, it is just very much appreciated. It makes uh, us be prepared for decisions in the long term. And uh, I can't overstate how important it is for your service. And uh, you don't get congratulated enough, but uh, your, your service is very much appreciated by this board and I know by the people of Santa Cruz County. So thank you all for your service. It's invaluable uh, uh, service that you provide to our community. Um, I, and in that vein on the uh, committee assignments and all, I wanted to amend the, uh, the list that we have to uh, make some an additional direction to appoint Supervisor Coonerty to the Community Corrections Partnership, which wasn't included in the original list that we have before us now. So I'd like to amend that to have him be on the Community Corrections Partnership. Um, the, uh, on uh, going back to, um, um, Item number 30, perhaps uh, I hope this is all right to uh, have as an amendment to or an additional direction from uh, on item number 30 that we should verbally uh, state something to this effect that uh, in compliance with the relevant provisions of the government code, code I am announcing that the cons on the consent agenda today, item 30 is an item advancing the county council to the next step on the publicly posted salary schedule. Uh, I just wanna make sure with the county council himself that this is the proper way to do that, to amend that, would that be sufficient? Yes, uh, uh, Chair McPherson, uh, there's no amendment uh, required to the agenda or anything like that. It was just a requirement of the government code that you make an oral announcement uh, of that at the meeting. And so you've done that, thank you very much. Okay. And then uh, usually we don't go into the correspondence, but I just would like to point out that in a letter from CAL FIRE Director Tom Porter regarding our board's request to enforce uh, uh, CAL FIRE as CAL FIRE may see fit against PG&E's action at the CZU fire. I was uh, glad to read that uh, CAL FIRE is continuing to investigate and will use all of the enforcement tools that it finds appropriate. And I hope the same of the other enforcement agencies contacted by this board. Uh, so I just want to uh, specifically thank him under the circumstances and the actions that we have previously taken. Okay, so I think we are ready to, um, for a motion on the consent agenda. I'll move the recommended action. This is Coonerty. Okay, with, with the amendments? Correct. With, yeah, with, with the additional direction and amendments. Thank you. Okay. Sir. Uh, we'll, we'll call the roll on this, please. Supervisor Conant? Aye. 
Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. Chair McPherson? Aye. That passes unanimously. We will now go on to item number seven on the on the agenda. This is an item that uh, hold on for a second. Sorry about that. Um, consider a report on the drug medical organized delivery system pilot program that provides funding for substance use disorder and direct the health services agency to return December 7th, 2020. One with an annual report including budgetary projections and actuals, service position and network expansion, and take related actions as a lot outlined in the memorandum of the Director of Health Services. Thank you. I think we have a presentation from Health Services. Good morning. I'm going to just share my screen here. <laughs> And can you see my presentation? Yes, I can. Uh, Great. Good morning, board. I'm Eric Riera. I'm the Behavioral Health Director for Santa Cruz County. And I'm here this morning to present an annual update on our drug Medi-Cal organized delivery system for Santa Cruz County. The ODS program is a state and federal waiver program between the state of California and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services to expand the availability of substance use disorders in our community. These expanded services are available to any county resident who has Medi-Cal as their insurance. And the specific services and level of care an individual is connected to is based on the American Society of Addiction Medicine, ASAM, criteria. We've had to address a number of significant system pivots within our county, um, the big one being the onset of COVID-19, which has had significant impacts on our substance use disorder services, both here in Santa Cruz and on a statewide basis. Some of our residential services had to be halted temporarily as our service providers adjusted their protocols in order to meet the demand for services in a safe manner for both their clients as well as their staff. Our outpatient service programs rapidly launched a telehealth model with various levels of engagement success for different populations in the community. And our cost of care increased due to census limitations and new equipment costs that were connected with the pandemic. Our current services are delivered under an 1115 waiver, which includes the ODS services that we'll be talking about this morning. That waiver expired in December 31st of 2020 and has recently been extended for one more year until December 31st, 2021. We are also working very closely with the State Department of Healthcare Services on a new innovation program for the Medi-Cal program called CalAIM, California Advancing and Innovating Medi-Cal. And that project was also extended for another year to year and a half due to the onset of the pandemic. This next slide is an illustration of our different levels of care within the ODS system, from lower level of care services on the left to higher levels of care on the right, which is determined by the needs of the individual through the ASAM assessment. It's a continuation of a model where residential is considered crisis management services and the objective is to provide treatment in the least restrictive setting possible. We 
we've had a number of areas where we've been expanding capacity. The first is with the certification of the Pajaro Valley Prevention and Student Assistant Program for Youth. We've expanded both outpatient services that we've contracted with them for by over 92,000 units. And we've also recently certified the new Life Center for Adult Residential Services, adding an additional 11 beds, which will come online this month in January. The ODS funding picture is very complicated. Um, it is made up of a number of different funding sources, and it's very often difficult to predict. We have the component of federal financial participation, FFP, where we use local and state funds to leverage for federal funding funds matched under the Medi-Cal program. And we also have a number of other funding sources, including federal substance abuse block grant funds, state realignment funds, family and children's services funds, and local and county general funds, all of which are used to support the cost of providing services in the community. We've been dealing with a number of funding challenges since the implementation of the program. First area is around budget predictions and their connection to FFP drawdown is based on a beneficiary mix and anticipated service delivery and a very complex set of services that's difficult to predict. In FY18 and 19, we had increased dollars that were provided to the county through realignment. However, those dollars came with significant limitations in terms of what we could use them for relative to specific services in the community. And we also have some significant limitations in terms of how we set our rates and get those rates approved with both the state and federal government. And there's a process that we go through on an annual basis, which we're currently going through right now, in order to provide substantiation of those increased costs on a local level so that we can draw down additional federal funds to support the provision of services. The next slides, I wanted to highlight some of our annual expenditures since the beginning of the program and expansion of services under the ODS waiver. In fiscal years 17 and 18, we had a partial year implementation and we provided approximately $4.7 million of services. In fiscal year 18-19, we had an initial projected deficit of a million dollars. We were able to use an infusion of state realignment funds, including $279,000 from our realignment funding in the mental health area to deliver a balanced budget for 18 and 19. And we provided approximately $7.2 million of services that year. For FY19 and 20, we had an initial projected deficit of $1.4 million. The onset of COVID-19 in quarter three exacerbated our revenue losses and produced approximately $500,000 less in federal finance and participation, those federal funds, than we originally budgeted and anticipated for. And we provided just under $8 million of services. And that's pending our final reconciliation for the year. When the public health emergency was declared this past fiscal year, our programs were authorized to increase their rates by the state. However, the state provided no additional funds to support the increased rates that were authorized. Um, so we had to come up with those funds on a local level. 
And for fiscal year 2021, we do have ongoing increases in provider costs, which will result in heavier reliance on local county general funds to bridge the gap between anticipated revenues and expenditures. And we're looking at that very closely this year. All within the context of those service provision mandates that are established by the state and federal government as a managed care provider. The next section that I wanted to review is around data analysis and our system for looking at both the provision of services as well as the impact that those services have on the residents of our county. So under service provision, we have a number of service utilization metrics that we look at. And under impact, we have a number of data points that we examine closely to look at meaningful change within the system. The first area is around the provision of services. Um, we have a number of metrics that look at treatment episodes that were initiated in each modality across the drug Medi-Cal organized delivery system network and days of service, number of outpatient treatment days or bed nights provided by the network. First area is around admissions for both outpatient services and intensive outpatient services. The gold line is the initiation of the ODS waiver. And the red line is when we first started seeing the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. And as you can see, we had a significant drop in admissions when COVID-19 first hit our community. The next slide shows data on admissions within residential program. Same kind of trending with the onset of COVID-19, we had significant reductions in residential capacity. However, those are again on the upswing um, and we anticipate that those will eventually return to pre-COVID-19 levels. Eric, can I interrupt for a second and just ask while you're on the Absolutely. slide? Absolutely. So yeah. It looks, um, it looks as though there was a reduction before COVID-19. In fact, prior to the red line, there's actually fewer residential admissions than there was uh, before the implementation. Can you talk about why that there's a decline starting, it looks like, in Q4 of 2018-19? Yeah, I think one of the things you can see from the slide is that the, the pattern tends to go up and down. There are peaks and valleys. As we rely more on the ASAM assessment to get the specific levels of care right, um, the state has wanted us to rely less on this most costly service and build capacity in some of our other option services like outpatient and intensive outpatient services in the community. So I expect that trend to continue as we build capacity in those other areas and get better outcomes that will have to rely less on residential programs. Um, so I think those are the two factors that, that I would mention in terms of that trend that you're seeing. Okay, but over time, and on the previous slide, slide, if you can go back one, it's a similar phenomenon. Uh, but over time, sort of net, the overall trend should be upwards, right? Yeah, it, it, overall, it will be upward. And we have planned some system expansions prior to COVID hitting. And I think we're running against the constraints around that. And so it'll be interesting to see what happens when we come out of this pandemic, what those trends look like. Um, but it certainly impacted the numbers of people who are seeking services and, and access to those services as we've had capacity reduced, at least on a temporary basis. Yeah, and I think, I think we all understand the limits that have been placed on us by COVID. I guess I'm concerned about for the pre or some of those pre COVID numbers, if you look quarter to quarter, there's not a, it doesn't look as, as much of an increase considering the amount of investment that they've made. 
Yeah, we'll definitely be keeping close track on that and continuing to provide updates to the board on, on what those numbers look like. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, one area of interest that's been mentioned before is around our withdrawal management program. Uh, these are our trend lines on admissions. As you can see, those have been somewhat less affected by COVID-19. Uh, again, the red line is, is when the pandemic first um, started hitting our community in a significant way back in March. Um, there was an initial drop, but the trend line shows that that's continuing to trend upward and, and we anticipate that that pattern will continue into the future. This is days of service um, for both outpatient and intensive outpatient, um, also heavily impacted by COVID-19 and haven't necessarily recovered yet. Um, as it's, you know, again, we have a number of challenges in terms of getting people into these programs, which are currently being delivered using a telehealth model. Um, which isn't as effective for this population as, as some other groups of people in the community. And tying into a similar trend that we saw with residential services, significant drop in terms of days of service. Um, so the number of days that people are, are um, utilizing within those residential programs, they have leveled off um, at this point, but there's been significant restrictions on capacity due to the need to quarantine individuals in these programs and reduce the actual census um, to keep the residents and the staff safe. And this is days of service for withdrawal management. Um, saw a drop off, but it's trending upward and we continue to expect that that trend will continue for the withdrawal management programs. Next measures are around impact. So we're looking at new beneficiaries accessing care. So these are community members who engaged in services for the first time during the ODS pilot. Uh, there are measures around discharge outcomes. So what are the results of those treatment episodes for adults and youth? And then housing status change for homeless beneficiaries. So we serve a percentage of people who are homeless coming into substance use disorder services. And we look at the percentage of beneficiaries reporting homelessness at intake and housing status at discharge. This graph is for new beneficiaries accessing care. Um, we see an actual drop off in adults, um, which again corresponds to the COVID-19 pandemic. However, we saw an inverse effect with youth um, and that uptick tech and youth services um, is a reflection of targeted efforts to engage more youth specifically through the PVPSA expansion of services. These are some outcome measures for adults within the ODS system. Um, what we see is that we have less people year over year leaving treatment without progress and more people leaving with progress. Roughly the same amount of people who are completing treatment. And about 38% of the beneficiaries or participants represented in these statistics were actually homeless coming into our ODS programs. We do not have um, specific data for that subset of people in terms of whether their outcomes differ from the overall adults who went through the ODS programs. But some of the highlights here, 28% um, left with satisfactory progress 
compared to 14% in the prior year, 33% completed treatment compared to 32% in the prior year, and 39% left with unsatisfactory progress compared to 54% in the prior year. These are some youth discharge outcomes. Um, again, we have some comparisons year over year. 35% of the youth completed treatment compared to the prior year of 15%. 25% left with satisfactory progress compared with 35% in the prior year. So we have a decrease in that area. And 40% left with unsatisfactory progress compared to 50% in 2019. This next graph is a housing status change for homeless individuals who participated. Um, in, in fiscal year 19 and 20, we had about 426 beneficiaries who reported homelessness at the time of admission. It's about 38% of our clients admitted to treatment. And this graph shows how many of those homeless individuals were housed at the end of their treatment stay. And we see a gradual um, uptick in outcomes in that specific area. Back in 17 and 18, it was just over 15%. In quarter four of 19 and 20, it was just over 30% were housed at the end of their treatment episode. And finally, this next slide are some of our key priorities for 2021. Um, certainly maintaining as much flexibility as we can as this pandemic evolves. The launch of expanded residential beds is another priority, both within the county with New Life Center, and we're also exploring uh, residential bed capacity outside of the county. Should we need that overflow capacity, we have a number of contracts that we're looking at implementing this fiscal year and next fiscal year to have that overflow capacity if needed. Strong collaboration with the Department of Healthcare Services on the Cal AIM project, which will likely change the way we're reimbursed for services in a very significant way, and implementing new outcome measures. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Good. Um, I think we'll start with the uh, second district supervisor, Zach Friend. Any questions? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I do not have any questions. Thank you for the presentation, Mr. Riera. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Third District Supervisor Coonerty. Uh, thank you. Uh, I appreciate this information. I also understand this has been an extremely taxing time on HSA um, to be operating an initiative this, this size and complexity. Um, overall, I think we're going in the right direction. I think, um, you know, and I, we understand the limits that have been placed on services uh, as a result of COVID. I think going forward, I'd like to uh, ask that we have this information, you know, in the staff report before, before the presentations so that we can ask more questions and get clarity on some of these new outcome measures and Cal AIM funding. Um, Impl the implications of the Cal AIM funding uh, going forward in advance. So uh, so the next report I look forward, hopefully to what a post COVID future looks like, uh, but hopefully some information, more information in advance, because this is such a critical program and a large investment by the county. Uh, we need to we need to understand how it's how it's going. Yes, and I think the, the CALIM funding issue is probably one of the most significant changes we'll see on both the mental health side as well as the substance use disorder side. So that would be critical to have some updates on, on where that stands. Absolutely. I did notice that the government put money in the budget uh, for it, but, uh, but it would be nice to know what the impacts are locally. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot, Eric. Uh, I want to thank you for all the work you've done with the Mental Health Advisory Board. And uh, uh, anyway, I have no questions right now, but uh, thank you very much for everything you're doing. Thank you.
Supervisor Cooney. Yeah, thank you. Um, so it seems like the, uh, well, I guess first I'd like to echo Supervisor Coonerty's um, comments that it would be great to receive some of this information ahead of time to properly uh, digest it and give feedback. Um, it seems that we've seen a reduction in the number of folks uh, using the service, uh, as Supervisor Coonerty also pointed out, but an increase in cost. Uh, and I, is there, um, have you charted the cost per Per person in order to really get a sense of, of how much costs are increasing uh, and do you have a, is that simply due to service providers increasing costs or is it attributable to something else it's primarily due to the costs for our service provider network increasing year after year and post pandemic um, onset as our provider network has served less people, um, their fixed costs are remain the same. So the per person cost has gone up significantly. Okay. Um, and then how many, you know, I, I mean, we were showing the success of, of youth compared to adults, uh, the percentage enrollment. Um, can you give us some idea just in terms of like the total numbers, uh, how many participants in the program are youth compared to adults? Um, I'll have to get that information to you, Supervisor. I don't have it um, immediately available. Okay, thank you. Be happy um, to do that. Great. Um, and what defines completing treatment or satisfactory progress? Well, as I mentioned in the presentation, we have various levels of care and individuals might enter at one level and successfully complete treatment in that level. And then they often move to another level of care. So an example would be starting off in our highest level of care residential treatment. They'll complete a 30 day stay and then successfully move to a lower level of care and continue treatment there. But for some people, um, success in treatment is, is clearly individually defined. Um, so it may mean um, not abstinence or stopping the use of alcohol or other drugs. It might mean for that particular person a significant reduction. So the outcomes are defined both by the person participating as well as, as some of our more objective measures using the ASAM. Great, thanks. Uh, and then you didn't have a, uh, you mentioned there's no success comparison at the moment between um, people who are housed and people experiencing homelessness. Is that correct? We, we have the global outcome measures, but we didn't break out the homeless population yet to see if those differ for people who are homeless versus who are housed. I would be very interested in, in seeing that. Um, and then a final question um, relating to the number of the 30% of, of participants who are housed at the end of a treatment episode. And, you know, we saw that graph increasing, which is, of course, very much in the right direction. Uh, I'm curious if that is, uh, is that a change in the program or is that simply a reflection of, you know, it takes a few years for people participating in the program to ultimately become housed? I mean, so are we looking essentially at sort of the same group of participants after a few years uh, in the program? Is that, or do you attribute the increase in housing outcomes to something else? I think it's a number of factors. Um, for the homeless in particular, there are additional challenges in terms of successful treatment outcomes and successful treatment completion, simply because of the fact that they are unhoused and often homeless on the street. Um, it's more difficult for them to participate and receive the benefits of a program when they're struggling with some of their more basic life needs. So very often for them, they're coming in and out of services more frequently than someone who might have stable housing housing in the community, for example. And there are also, in this goes back to an earlier point, which I, I should have mentioned around residential stays. Um, the state currently limits us 
to two residential stays per calendar year. And a residential stay doesn't equate to the full 30 day stay. So, and this, this ties in with our homeless population, for example. So if we have someone who's been very um, difficult to engage in the community and we get them into a residential program, if they stay for two days, that counts towards one stay. And then if we get them back into the program a week later and they leave after three days, that counts as their second stay. And they are not eligible to receive residential services for the rest of the calendar year. And that's something that we've been strongly advocating with the state to change. And they're considering in their new wavered program under CalAIM to eliminate that to stay requirement under the waiver because we might be more successful and we anticipate we would be more successful if it was based on a different set of factors such as total bed day utilization during the course of the year and not a residential stay. Okay, that, that's the end of my questions, thank you. Okay. Um, Thank you, Mr. Arrow, uh, for uh, your presentation. Uh, uh, do we know of any uh, overlap of ODM clients coming through referral? Um, I'm not sure I understand your question, Chair McPherson. Referral through where? Well, I did. Well, how would how the referrals that you do get? Uh, is there any overlap um, from? you know, other agencies or? Uh, Absolutely. Uh, you know, in, in particular, you know, the syringe exchange program that we have now. Yeah, we often receive referrals for the ODS program through multiple sources and many of our clients in substance use disorder services are connected with many different providers in the community. Um, and for some, it's, it's really receiving referrals from multiple sources and working with many different agencies that help get them connected with services on a longer term basis. So there's definitely a lot of overlap with our community partners, including our mental health providers and our human services department. Mm -hmm. um, do we... Um... Is that for actual treatment then? No. Yeah, and sometimes treatment might be lots of outreach and engagement work in the community before we can get them connected to an actual program. Okay. Um, I think you've answered this somewhat. Uh, how, are the, uh, how are we housing homeless patients when they are discharged from treatment? Or, or are we? Or how are we housing those that are, who were homeless? One of the options that we frequently look at are what's called sober living environments. So it's a shared housing model where people have made a commitment to um, live a, a drug-free, alcohol-free life. Um, so we have some treatment funding dollars that we use to support the initial part of a person stay in a sober living house and often when they get on benefits they will pay the rent themselves um, for that type of setting and it allows them to be with other people who are also working on their sobriety um, but for other people we are working with them um, to get their own apartment in the community and access to uh, housing vouchers to help support their rent for those apartments, but that's a challenge overall, as you know, um, with the low housing availability that we have within the county. Um, you know, the reimbursement uh, change, is that gonna be better for the county, you see, um, that's coming? 
I think the, the model that the state was first considering moving us to just two months ago would have been much better for the county because um, it would have provided much more flexibility for us um, in terms of treatment options and how we build our system of care. But the model that they're looking at now um, presents a number of challenges for the county. Um, we would no longer get reimbursed for our actual costs. Um, we would shift to a fee-for-service model, so it would be based on volume of services. And if we were hit with another pandemic or a similar um, scenario where people had reduced access to services, um, it would significantly negatively impact our revenues. So I am on the work group with that, um, with the state looking at different payment models. Um, so I'll be happy to keep you briefed and the board briefed on this, but it clearly presents a number of challenges for us if they shift to the model that they're proposing today. Yeah, and I, I guess that'll be for the discussion coming up after this about the budget uh, that we are going to be looking at pretty soon as well. Uh, so it doesn't look good in that respect anyway. No, uh, unfortunately uh, not. Um, and the uh, you, I think you might have um, answered some of this, the, the ongoing support provided to patients who complete the treatment. That's um, that's changing too, is that is that correct? the ongoing support or the housing issue is huge i know but yeah the, the housing issue is huge and um i wouldn't say that the ongoing support changes to folks um again we have a number of options available and we continue ex to expand those options to make sure that people have what they need to maintain their sobriety if again that's if that's the goal that they've set for themselves um so uh, I don't know that that's changed as much as just having the ongoing challenges, particularly for the homeless and getting them access to housing, stable housing in the community. Okay. Thank you. That's, um, uh, Clerk, do we have any uh, questions uh, from the general public? We do have a couple of people that wish to comment. Okay. One second, and I will share my screen to bring the timer up. Okay, our first caller is a call in caller. I believe it is Miss Garrett. You will have two minutes to speak. I am unmuting you now. Please accept the unmute when you begin to speak. The timer will start. Um, I'd like to say that this emergency situation, lockdown, shutdown, uh, it has compelled more people into desperation, substance abuse, um, and the, I'm going to read just a little bit from a document on this topic, isolation and financial abuse, financial loss have led to major increases in depression, anxiety, suicide, family violence, and child abuse. The fear and isolation drive up suicide, violence at home, depression, and anxiety. The journal Lancet reported on October 24, 2020, that overdose deaths are up globally more than 20% due to mental and physical lockdown trauma. So the situation you have put people into by this uh, out of control policies are increasing the problems you are addressing here. And uh, 
there is another, every symptom we're hearing about that people are suffering is blamed on COVID-19, which is a respiratory virus closely related to the common cold. But there is another very real pandemic that is out of control, a pandemic of radiation, a pandemic that does cause kidney, heart damage, strokes, in addition to no. Our next speaker is Ms. Monica McGuire. You will have two minutes to speak. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and start speaking. The timer will begin when you start. Uh, again, it's not. it doesn't always show. Can you hear me now? Yes. No. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for saying my full name. Please say Marilyn Garrett's full name and Becky Steinbrenner's and everybody else's when you have already heard from them at the very least, but you can keep track of their phone numbers and say it. Um, it's so, so interesting to participate this way. Um, I'm, I just want to point out the obvious, uh, Marilyn pointed out some of it, and it is that there's this over-focus on COVID-19 that is impossible to follow in any of those slides. Thank you so much, Mr. Koenig, for bringing all that up. Monica Koenig's questions are excellent. I wish the other supervisors had the same ones. Um, Mr. Coonerty, I don't understand how you can say, gosh, next time show us that information ahead of time, because why on earth isn't it a norm that the agenda packet has enough information that the members of the public and the supervisors can understand this information ahead of time? That makes no sense. It makes no sense to me that the slides are so difficult to understand because they're filled with all these references to quarter one, two, three of double digit years, and they aren't long enough to see any real trends. You barely begin to address the fact that you can see the negative effects built into some of what was presented, but our government has been pushed so long, so hard to pretend to be all bureaucratic and boring instead of the most important thing in our life, our local government, that the, this is the norm at these meetings, that we see these kinds of presentations presented in such a dry and uninspired method that it's impossible for people to understand the basic nuts and bolts that was built in there. Thank you for pointing out by accident how much damage this whole past year has done to our youth because they are being forced to stay home when we have a virtually zero death rate and we're so far beyond the initial emergency stated. We have deeply important things to talk about. Please converse supervisors. Thank you, Monique, for your questions. Chair McPherson, that is the end of public comment. Okay, uh, this is a, a report that we received. I do not think we take, need any official action. Um, we will now, um, unless there's any uh, closing comments by any supervisor. Uh, I just yes. had one additional question. Um, so I just want to make sure if I understand uh, correctly, um, is it fair to assume that if we increase participation in the program, it'll be more fo more financially robust? Yes, that's correct. All right, great. Thank you. I uh, think that has implications as we look at providing more housing and, and maybe making program participation a uh, stipulation of of some of those housing options. Okay. And Mr. Chair, this is an accept and file, so I will actually move the recommended actions. Oh, okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Second? Do we have a second? Second. Okay. It's been uh, moved and second that we accept okay. the report. Uh, and one more thing, Mr. Chair. Um, Supervisor Coonerty, did you have additional direction uh, during your commentary? You had made some additional requests. Did you want that as additional direction, or are you okay with just an accept and file as is? Okay. I'm okay with an accepted file and just, uh, I think the will of the board hopefully has been articulated and we'll get it back uh, post pandemic. Thank you. Please call oh. the roll. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Sup Supervisor Caput? Chair McPherson. I call on Mr. Caput one more time. Supervisor Caput. Oh, 
Hi, I finally, uh, yeah, I got disconnected. Thank you. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, it passes unanimously five to zero. We will go on now to item number eight to consider an update on the fiscal year 21-22 budget forecast and direct the county administrative office to return on February 23rd, 2021 with further update as outlined in the memorandum of the county administrative officer. Um, Mr. Palacios. Uh, thank you, Chair McPherson and members of the board. Uh, Carlos Palacios, County Administrative Officer. Um, I will say that this has been a very challenging uh, budget year for the county as, as it has for all local governments, but in particular for the county uh, government because we are at the forefront of the response to the health, the uh, public health pandemic and county services are being taxed to the full. We also are at the forefront to the response to the fires this summer. And then now uh, we are at the forefront of the efforts to distribute the vaccines. So this is a very challenging time for county government at a time uh, when we have great needs in the community for our safety net programs and our response to the emergency. We also have decreased revenues. And what you'll see in today's report is that we are doing slightly better than we had uh, projected, but we still have not recovered to pre-pandemic or pre-COVID levels. So our revenues, although slightly better than we had projected, still are below what we had received prior to the pandemic. And so that continues to be a challenge that we have, are facing. Uh, the good news uh, is there's a couple of good news. One is that the board's uh, very uh, conservative fiscal stewardship in the past has allowed us to get through um, this pandemic uh, recession uh, with maintaining our most uh, important public uh, services. And so the ability of the board to set aside money in our fiscal reserves allowed us to get through the worst uh, time period uh, in recent county history without major cuts to our, our budget. I'll also say the good news is that our county employees agreed um, at the very beginning to take uh, furloughs as a way to save jobs and maintain services. And I'd like to thank our, our county employees and our labor partners for the sacrifices they have made to maintain our public services. Uh, so um, the other piece of good news is you'll see that our revenues uh, are progressing in a positive direction. And we hope that uh, once the vaccine is widely, widely distributed, we will be able to make uh, a significant progress towards a full recovery and restoration of our revenues to pre-pandemic uh, or pre-COVID levels. So with that, I'm going to ask uh, Christina Mowry, our the county budget manager, to provide an overview of and more detail on our uh, preliminary budget forecast for fiscal year 2021. Thank you, Carlos. And good morning, uh, Chair McPherson and members of the board. Um, as Carlos mentioned, I'm gonna um, share a presentation and, and highlight for you some of the key information. Um, and I will be focusing on the general fund because the general fund is where you have the most discretion um, and, and on the uh, general county revenues and how you uh, allocate those resources to the various departments. So let me just... Okay. So as mentioned, we're gonna... Um, first, I'm gonna cover a little bit about the... Um, impacts uh, that COVID has uh, uh, prior to COVID, some current year estimates for 2021. Um, and then I will cover some of the highlights for the 21-22 preliminary forecast based on the information we have currently, and then summarize sort of opportunities and challenges and, and where we're at with budget instructions. Christina, we still are not seeing your screen. Oh, you're not seeing the screen? That's interesting. Okay. Um, I clicked share. Okay, now we see it. Okay. There we go. 
Sorry about that. Thank you, Carlos. Okay, so we're going to cover the 2021 update, uh, the forecast, and then a summary. So I just want to remind the board uh, where we were at prior to COVID. Um, about a year ago, um, we brought um, a forecast to your board, and we were looking at um, savings from the current year of about four and a half million dollars that was uh, going to be carried forward as part of the financing for the general fund. We were anticipating uh, general and department revenue growth of more than eight million dollars, or five percent. Um, and we did uh, believe that would be enough to offset some of our costs, our, our status quo cost of operations for the departments. But we were still left with a shortfall of about seven and a half million dollars um, pre-COVID. And we were asking the departments to make uh, reductions of two and a half to 12 and a half percent, which was very manageable at the time. And we were able at that time to forecast uh, keeping our reserves intact at 57.6 million, which is about, which is our goal of 10% of the total general fund revenues. Um, uh, when COVID hit, we updated our projections and we had to revise our budget. Um, we had no savings to carry forward from 1920 to 2021. And we actually had a shortfall at the end of last year due to the decline in revenues. Um, and that was about $3.4 million that carried over we had general and department revenue declines of up to $23 million uh, or 14% uh, anticipated for 2021. Um, and that was offset by department reductions of up to 20%, uh, which did include some layoffs. And we um, were happy to uh, have a county furlough to help offset about a third of those costs, anywhere from five to 10%. Um, we actually did go in um, to reduce our reserves to make up another third of the losses of about $13.4 million, leaving about $44 million in the reserves or 7% of our total revenues, which is the minimum um, uh, reserve uh, as part of the policy. So here you'll see the revenue projections pre-COVID compared to the adopted budget. Um, the two primary changes in revenues um, that we anticipated uh, was, of course, in sales tax and the hotel tax or transient occupancy tax. That's where the majority of the um, revenue losses were anticipated. Um, overall, <clears throat> excuse me, we had about a, a $10 million loss in revenues from our pre-COVID estimates uh, to the adopted budget, or about 6.2%. Um, another large area where we saw a decline in, in uh, revenue is in our interest earnings because our, our interest allocation currently is fairly low. So the departments have been updating their estimates for the current year and we've been relying on those estimates and they'll continue to make progress as we go through the year. Um, here you'll see overall, um, and we've left the pre-COVID comparison there for you, but overall, when you look at the adopted budget, which is the second column there compared to our current year estimates, you know, we're looking at about a $3.3 million um, unanticipated growth, which is about 2% compared to our original estimates. And you'll see there the majority of that is made up of um, from our sales tax. Uh, growth is a little better than anticipated. Uh, primarily due to the increase in online sales uh, that's making up some of the difference in the reduction in our, our local uh, point of sale. Um, and the hotel tax is doing a little bit better than anticipated, about half as better, uh, making up almost another $2 million. We did see a, a little bit of a decline in our property tax. As you know, the fire um, did have an impact. Um, and our, our supplemental increases have declined a little bit. Um, and that, that's offset by some of that growth from sales tax and hotel tax. Um, then we have some minor changes in cannabis uh, business tax and the deed transfer tax. Um, interest earnings is a little, little worse than we originally thought. Um, and then that's offset by a little bit of shift in other revenues and reimbursements. Um, okay. 
So here you'll see just a summary of how that translates to the general fund financing. So overall, the, the general revenues budget had the $3.3 million anticipated. Um, so our financing, the general fund is financed from the carryover fund balance plus the general revenues, <clears throat> excuse me, which we just looked at. So overall, the general fund financing is, is, is going up by the $3.3 million um, or about 2%. And that's offset and that funds the department net costs. And the department net costs are the difference between the department revenues and the department expenses that are general fund funded. So overall, even though a couple departments are having some revenue shortfalls this year due to the, the impact COVID has had on their operations, we have some savings in other areas. And we have contingencies, as your board knows, you've already allocated some of the contingencies this year to help offset some of the increased fire costs, uh, which we had not anticipated. So overall, we're doing, uh, we expect our net costs to be less by about a million dollars, uh, thanks to having a, a sizable amount in contingencies. And we'll have about $4.3 million estimated preliminarily <laughs> that could carry over as part of the financing for next fiscal year. And here you'll see a summary um, at the total fund level. Again, the fund balance added to the total revenues. Now these revenues here aren't just the general county revenues, these include all the department revenues. Um, so you'll see an increase there of about $11.5 million. We've had some um, increased um, revenues and expenditures in, within the departments related to the emergency and those increased costs and expenditures have been allocated. Um, so overall, the, um, the savings here is the same, um, but you'll see that those, those budget estimates um, compared to the estimates are up about with between one and 2% of the original budget. So just to give you some highlights on the 21-22 forecast, remember as part of this process, we give you, normally we do this in December, we postponed it until January. Um, we have um, it, given the department some initial instructions. Um, they're gonna be, uh, we're gonna be receiving their budgets, um, their requests um, by the middle of uh, February at the latest. And then we're gonna be giving your board another update we call that the mid-year update, and that will come to you in February, the end of February, and you'll get an update of where we're at at that time. So here you'll see sort of the, the forecast of the 21-22 the general county revenues. Um, and you'll see overall that we're expecting about $5.2 million in growth, or, or about 3.4%. Again, the same uh, revenues that assisted us in the current year, sales tax and TOT, we're projecting a similar amount of growth um, to continue. Um, and then of course, our other revenues here are, are, are similar as well, cannabis deed transfer tax and interest earnings are still projected to um, be down the similar amount they're down this year. Um, and then the other thing that helps us next year is we are still, even though we, before COVID, we anticipated that our general revenues would decline, um, we still are seeing a sizable amount or modest amount of property tax growth. So in the current year, we had about 5%. We're estimating next year to have uh, some continued growth in our property taxes of about 4%. That generates about $2.6 million. So combined with the sales tax and the, um, the TOT or hotel tax revenues, that unfortunately is offset by some one-time money we received this year um, from uh, our CRF plan. We had some additional funding um, as a part of the CRF plan to help offset some of our, our disaster service worker costs. And that's shown in this um, other revenues um, as part of the general county revenues. And so we're seeing a, 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 a shortfall or a reduction there, which was one time for the current year. So overall, $5.2 million uh, or 3.4%. Now, as Carlos mentioned, even though we're seeing $5.2 million in growth, we're still 
approximately $5 million away from our pre-COVID estimates. So we're only through next fiscal year, we're only anticipating to get about halfway there. And here you'll see our preliminary estimate of the general fund expenditures. One of our primary expenditure increases is of course our salaries and benefits. Our status quo increases are, are estimated at $12.8 million. Um, and we have some other costs, fixed costs. We anticipate some reductions in uh, fixed assets and some of our one-time um, emergency costs that we saw this year. Um, offset by some other fixed uh, increases, uh, minor amount. And then we have a large amount of contingencies included in this year's budget because we have that additional funding. And, uh, and then we anticipate next year only having a minimal amount set aside a little, we try to set aside about 1% of our expenditures in a general contingency to help us offset any of the um, unanticipated revenue shortfalls or expenditure increases. And then we always have a small amount that's set aside for any mid-year adjustments uh, for the departments. So overall, we're seeing a, a reduction there in contingencies, which helps offset some of our increases. But in total, we're expecting about uh, $9.4 million in our status quo increases, which is about 1.5% of the total expenditures. Now we'll see, these are preliminary. We'll see what uh, we receive from the departments and some additional information will be provided to you in February. Here's a summary of our general fund contingencies. You'll see a comparison of the adopted budget, our estimate uh, for the current year, and then the forecast for next year. And, um, you know, we have our general contingency, as I just mentioned, which is um, we, we set that aside. We hope never to have to use it. Um, so far this year, we haven't had to use it. Um, we have uh, have mid-year adjustments. We anticipate some departments um, are not going to quite be able to stay within their budget adjustments. We've already, and we anticipate using some of that this year. Um, we have obviously the emergency repairs and the response this year. We were prudent for the first time in years to set aside some of that in the budget. Um, and we've used more than what we've set aside um, based on what the need was uh, as part of the fire recovery response and the local match needed on the um, state and federal funding that's been provided for the emergency. Um, we have some realignment funding for the trigger cut set aside. We don't believe we're gonna need that. Um, based on realignment revenues doing a little better than expected, but we've set aside a small amount. And then we have some, a little bit of other, rev, uh, other set aside um, and we expect to be able to use that. So overall, the contingencies, as I mentioned, um, are expected next year at a minimum to be $6.2 million. Um, if the resources allow, it would be better if we could increase that a uh, slight amount so that we could cover in case we have continued emergencies. Here's a summary of our general fund reserves compared to um, the adopted budget last year where we were at pre-COVID, uh, the adopted budget this year and the forecast for next year. So due to the financial constraints, we're not anticipating as we sort of work our way through the recovery of, from COVID, um, and the fires to not be able to increase our reserves at this time. Um, but we do have a small amount. Uh, your board may recall that prior to um, fiscal year 1920, we were still recovering from our previous uh, storm damage uh, emergency. And we had some increased uh, local match needed to cover uh, those costs. And your board allocated $2 million out of reserves from the natural uh, disaster reserve. And so the reserve policy dictates that we have a plan to restore those reserves. So we have a multi-year plan and we're setting aside as part of that plan, $400,000 a year in order to restore that $2 million reserve. So that's the only thing we'll be contributing or recommending to contribute at this time. So because we did go from a 10%, a as mentioned earlier, reserve down to a 7.2% reserve. Um, when we took $13 million out of reserves um, to help balance our budget for this fiscal year. 
And then here you'll see a summary um, of the actual general fund. Uh, you'll see here the, the fund balance and the revenues make up the total financing for the general fund. And you'll see in the, the adopted column that we have a balanced budget. In the forecast, um, we talked about the $4.3 million that we're preliminary estimating that we should have in savings from the current year to carry forward. Um, but that still leaves us with a $9.1 million in fund balance that isn't available. Remembering, of course, that all of this fund balance came from reserves. Um, and then in the revenues, we anticipate the revenue growth from the general county revenues of 5.2 million. And the balance of the revenue there is from the departments. So typically we assume that when the departments have increased status quo costs that are state and federally funded, they typically, in most cases, will see an increase in their revenue reimbursements for those costs, as long as the, the state and federal government, government are able to continue those programs. So that's why this the revenues here are showing a bit higher but still within about 2% of the original budget from this year. And that makes up the total financing. So when you take into account that we don't have as much fund balance, um, even though we have some increased revenues, our overall financing is only increasing by $5.4 million in this current uh, preliminary estimate. And our costs, as we uh, described earlier, our status quo costs are increasing by $9.4 million at a minimum. And we'll see what, what other cost increases the departments um, submit to us as part of their requests. So overall, we're anticipating in a status quo uh, situation, at a minimum, we would have a $4 million shortfall for next fiscal year. Now we have, um, we do have, uh, yeah, let's see here. Sorry about that, I got off track. Okay. So I wanna mention the furlough because in the status quo version, we're assuming continued furlough. Um, we know the furlough expires at the end of this fiscal year and um, we have to bargain with SEIU in order to continue the furlough. Um, so we, we know there's a, people would love to get off a of furlough. We'd love to get off a of furlough also. The last time we were on furlough, it took us multiple years to have the financial constraints and maintain as many programs and services to the community before we could get off a of furlough. And we did it in steps. Um, and so we are looking at um, if we restored the furlough fully, um, it costs us an additional 11 to $12 million in order to 100% restore the furlough. That's the general fund cost. Um, and if we restored half of it, we would have about a $10 million shortfall. It's another, that's about $6 million. So here I wanna show you sort of our forecast. If you take all this information into account over the next five years, um, it's apparent that and typically that our expenditure growth ex will exceed our revenue growth. Um, in this forecast, the expenditure growth and the revenue growth is estimated using a 2% historical average growth on revenues and expenditures. Um, which you can see was, was pretty consistent with what we are experiencing this year. Um, our financing includes the revenues and an estimated annual budget to actual savings of 4 million each year to carry forward as part of the financing. And in this chart here, you can see the financing in the green line estimated to grow um, from 622 million to 679 million. Um, the current status quo expenditures shown in the blue line at of 622 million are expected to grow to 684 million, leaving about a, a four to $5 million gap as it, as it grows before we even begin to restore the furlough. And the gray line here represents uh, the increased expenditures if 50% of the furlough is restored over the two years beginning next year. This increases the gap by $5.8 million for a total shortfall of $9.8 million, growing to $17 million by fiscal year 25-26. The, 
The black line represents the expenditure estimates reflecting the full restoration of the furlough by 21-22, increasing the gap from 11.5 million for a total shortfall of 15 million growing to 17 million. So if the revenue growth is less than 2%, then the gap may be greater. And the gap may grow further if expenditures are higher for costs that have yet to be negotiated or implemented. In order to balance the future gaps in financing, most likely revenue measures and expenditure reductions will be necessary. Exactly. As shared before, revenue options could include a 1% increase in the hotel tax, which would generate about a million dollars in revenue, or and or a quarter cent sales tax measure, which generates approximately three and a half million dollars. And we are gonna to continue to look at those options in the future and your board will receive more information. So we've discussed our financial constraints. Um, we continue to have challenges, but we do have opportunities. Um, our challenges are that our general contingencies are less than 1% of expenditures. Our general fund reserves, um, since they were reduced uh, to balance the budget for this year, are now at 7% and the goal is 10. Um, and GFA, GFOA recommends even as much as 10 to 15% or more. Our emergency response costs may be higher and FEMA may disallow some of our reimbursements. Um, so if we have uh, enough financial uh, wherewithal, it would be prudent for us to set aside a reserve or a contingency uh, for FEMA disallowance of reimbursements. And we have, um, we have no funding at this time, we have no funding for the balance of our COVID response costs and or deferred maintenance, but we are, we have an opportunity that it's coming and we believe we will get additional funding for COVID. So our property taxes, they're on a slight decline. Um, the growth won't be known for sure until the assessor finishes the uh, uh, assessed value and the roll. Um, and, but we're currently estimating 4% in our uh, property tax growth. Um, we know that we'll likely have an additional debris flow uh, emergency, which will have increased costs, and we are preparing for that. Our actual revenues may not match our estimates. We may have some other revenues that may decline. Um, and our, some of our department costs may continue to go up. Some of one of the things that departments are struggling with is as we face these emergencies, some of their costs are coming in a bit higher. The good news is we're very fortunate with the changes in the administration. And um, we are expecting additional stimulus funding um, and Congress will hopefully discuss another relief bill. The relief bill that they just passed didn't have any funding in it for uh, uh, direct general funding for local uh, government, but there was some funding provided. Um, uh, health should be receiving some funding for testing and tracing and, um, and vaccine distribution. And we did just get word that we are gonna be getting some funding for rental assistance and your board will receive a report on that soon. Um, our costs uh, uh, will be less than budget once the emergency passes and that we are forecasting that in 21-22 the costs will stop to start to drop in some areas. Uh, and we will anticipate some conti continued support from other grants and our community partners um, to get through this. And we of course have Primo, our continuous process improvement that will help us create efficiencies and continue to look at how we do things so that we can be um, better prepared. So as I mentioned, we have issued some preliminary instructions to the departments um, based on the constraints and based on the fact that we have a shortfall and the fact that we would like to look at what it looks like to restore the furlough. We have issued instructions to the departments to have no increase in their general fund contribution or net county cost wherever possible and to provide us with three scenarios. One, a status quo scenario uh, where we continue furlough, uh, two, a 50% restoration of furlough, and three, 100% restoration of furlough. 
So the departments will provide those that information during their budget request to us, uh, which we'll be receiving some as early as the end of this month and through the general fund uh, departments are due through the middle of February. And then we'll bring that information back to your board. We believe, I should say, we believe that it's unlikely that we can restore 100% of the furlough, that the impacts will be too great, but we are hopeful and believe that it is possibly manageable to restore 50% um, of the furlough and still minimize the impacts on staffing programs and services, but more information will tell us soon. So the recommendation that's before you is to accept and file the report. We're happy to answer any questions or hear any additional recommendations uh, for the budget priorities for 21-22. Um, we will provide more information in a separate report to your board on the CRF funding um, and any future uh, funding that's provided. Um, and that will come hopefully by the next board meeting. And then the mid-year report, as mentioned, will be provided to your board by the end of February. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you, uh, Christina, Mowry, for that realistic, uh, compact, and co uh, comparative report. Uh, I think it, uh, we're going to know more when we discuss this. I believe the date is going to be February 23rd at our board meeting. Uh, I'd like to hear any comments from our board members, beginning with 3rd District Supervisor Ryan Coonerty. Yeah, uh, thanks, Christina. Um, and again, thank you to all the employees who have taken the furlough so we can get through this difficult time. I'm hopeful that we can uh, restore 50% uh, pending the federal funding and other sources. I'm wondering, do you have any uh, information about how either our health insurance or our CalPERS rates are gonna look uh, over the coming years? Yes, we have included in the forecast. I didn't go into any details on the PERS rates and health insurance. We usually provide that in the mid-year report. But I can tell you we did um, have an, a higher increase in health insurance rates this year. So that is included in the forecast and as part of that $12.8 million in status quo increases. Um, the health rates went up about 6%. And the PERS rates are continuing to go up. Um, they've increased oh, almost 70% in the last five plus years, and they're going to continue to go up um, as we start to recover from the, um, the CalPERS is, is um, trying to recover from some of the losses they've had in previous years. So our unfunded liability is continuing to grow, and we continue to pay a large portion of that to, to um, fund the pension. That's, uh, I appreciate that. That's frustrating news given that yes. uh, how the stock market's doing, CalPERS um, still needs to increase rates. And then given that uh, many people have, uh, are actually not getting medical care, uh, that you would think that our insurance rates would actually go down given that, um, given that they actually haven't, well, many people are putting off procedures and other things. Um, okay, and then um, in terms of uh, not having funds in the uh, emergency uh, contingencies, um, given the likelihood of debris flows or whatever else uh, comes forward, shouldn't we shouldn't we at least put a similar amount we did last year into that? Given 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 our realities. Yes, um, I. We will probably look at that. We're, we're, we have some money set aside this year um, that we believe we can probably carry forward to next year for that. We don't think we'll spend all of it. So that will, will um, be updated probably in February. We're waiting to see how the departments do. Um, a few departments, we kind of know where how they'll submit their request. There's a few departments that are more complicated. You just heard a report from Health Services on drug medical. Um, some of the larger departments, we need to wait to see their reports to see how they sort of balance the constraints and, and see where funding is needed. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your work. Mm -hmm. Supervisor Caput. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, what about the uh, future uh, pension uh, responsibilities that we have? Uh, are those growing uh, as people are retiring and uh, 
this is a crisis that's been coming for a number of years and is it is it are we able to meet all those uh, uh, costs that we have related to that? Yes, our our pension obligation costs are included in our status quo expenditures and we're a pay as you go county and um, the the pension rates and what the required amount uh, to pay each year is calculated by CalPERS based on our demographics and based on their policies and the rates. So um, we're, we're pay as you go and we do have an unfunded liability and it would be nice when we have enough uh, financial constraints to sort of um, make some progress on that unfunded liability as part of the overall county debt. Um, so we, we do take a close look at that every year to see if there's something we can do. Some counties that have greater resources than us are able to make an additional sizable payment each year to help pay down that debt. We've never been in that situation due to some of our constraints to be able to afford to, to make an additional payment each year. We just pay as we go based on the, uh, on the funding that's available. Okay, thank you. And then uh, uh, with our reserves, uh, we, we had it up to 56 million. That was uh, wonderful. But uh, reserves are supposed to be spent when we have an emergency like we had. And uh, uh, thankfully, uh, we did have a reserve. So what I'm getting at here is that uh, a reserve, if you never use it, like we had in the crisis right now, uh, would it, it really doesn't do anything, but we used it, we used part of it, and we still have quite a bit left. So what I'm getting at is uh, building the reserve back up at this moment is not a priority, uh, but in the future, it would be good to restore it to something uh, that we had in the past. That's great. It's always It's always good for us to be prepared for that next emergency. So it will be important for us to prioritize in the future when our when our revenues recover and we're in a different situation to be able to increase our reserves so that we can be prepared for that next emergency. Yes. Right. But in the long run, rather mm -hmm. than right yes. now. Thank you. Yes. Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Ms. Mallory, for the presentation. Um, I was surprised to see that we're expecting a 4% increase in uh, property tax revenues next year, uh, despite the uh, destruction from the fires. Um, so am I understanding correctly that that's simply because uh, of property turnovers and new assessed values that we expect that to significantly outweigh uh, loss from the fires? Yeah, the fires, even though it was we, we lost quite a few homes during the fires, it was definitely... Um, serious devastation that occurred. It's a relatively minor number of homes compared to the total roll and the number of homes within the county. So it did have an impact, but it, it and it had an, the impact to the general fund was uh, of less than a half a million dollars a year in property tax value in terms of a loss to the general fund. Now there are losses, every special district and the state gets a portion of those funding but we only keep 13 cents on the dollar. So the loss to us was relatively minor. The loss to the community was much greater. And so we, um, and the, we're still seeing growth. Um, our assessor anticipates continued growth. And what we're seeing is we have uh, homes that are still turning over. And so we're anticipating growth still. Got it. Is, is there any increased risk um, in, in that projection because of people who maybe uh, are not able to pay uh, their property taxes because of um, because of the fires. So we're on the teeter plan. So what that means is that we the auditor um, apportions 100% of the property tax related to the assessed value, and the county assumes the risk for that, and we have special reserves set aside um, as a part of the teeter plan. And the auditor will, will go through some of that and explain some of that in her mid-year report, which I believe she's going to be doing the end of January. And we can get you more information if you like. Okay. Um, right, so, so just to clarify, what the rebuilt properties will be assessed at their prior rates or new assessed value? 
they, I believe they'll go back to their prior rates. It depends on the, uh, the um, what they rebuild, if it's replaced or not. So, but I believe it goes back to the, the original value. The assessor is probably best to answer that. Um, and we can get you more information on that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm, certainly. Uh, well, thank you. I, I'm uh, pleased uh, in general um, with this uh, dreary outlook uh, that we're, we're forced into, but some good news coming from Sacramento and Washington regarding various uh, future supports related to COVID and uh, homelessness and fire recovery and other needs. Um, I, will, I know we're going to dive deeper into the details on February 23rd, but I think it's uh, important to recognize once again, as has been mentioned, that we couldn't have gotten this far and had been this good a shape under some most trying of circumstances without two critical pieces uh, of our employees and the furloughs that they accepted. We had a small number of layoffs and um, our healthy budget reserves. I know that reserves will be a target. I don't think anybody's suggesting that we reduce them more, but, um, you know, with debris flow issues or concerns staring us at the face, uh, we may have to dive deeper into that fund and we don't really want to go below 7% for sure. So uh, we need to be careful to uh, respect that and thank God we had it at uh, this time. Um, but I just want to say again, without uh, the sacrifices of our workforce and our strong reserves going into this crisis, uh, we would be slashing services and making deep uh, layoffs and gambling with our future stability in county government. So I'm, uh, I'm very pleased uh, we were in as good a position as we were. I'm happy to see that I hopefully we can maintain most of it as we move forward um, and uh, hope that we don't have any head, uh, heavy rains in the immediate future. Um, I did have some concerns about, or questions about the uh, property tax as well, but uh, you've answered those. So I, I do appreciate that. Um, do we have any uh, questions or remarks from the public? Yes, Chair, we have two hands up, I see. If you give me one second, I'll share my screen. Thank you. Okay, our first caller has a blocked caller ID, so I can't call you by your last four. However, if you are on the phone and you have your hand raised, please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. I am unmuting you now. Please accept the unmute and start speaking. The timer will start when you begin. Hi, this is Marilyn Garrett, and I've been watching some videos that shed light onto the context of what's going on globally. And one interview I heard was on the Children's Health Defense website with Daniel Pinchbeck, who is with Metabiota, and they evaluate uh, pandemic risk for insurance companies and the economics. And he said, 10,000 kids are dying a month in Africa from the lockdown. And the cost of the lockdown by December 31st will be $97 trillion. That money has been shifted from the middle class to the internet titans. Indeed, we've heard how Amazon, Google, the telecom industry, is benefiting greatly financially while the rest of us peons aren't. And I, the other document I have is called The Great Awakening by Common Freedom that came out December 25th in which he cites a document on the Great Reset and states the end game of the COVID coup was revealed in July 2020 when the World Economic Forum published a book called COVID-19, The Great Reset. And they state in that book, the pandemic represents a 
rare but narrow window of opportunity to reflect, reimagine, and reset our world to create a healthier, more equitable, and more prosperous future, writes author. Our next caller is Monica McGuire. I will, you will have two minutes to speak. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and start speaking. The timer will start when you do. So again, it's it's impossible to understand why you're limiting us to two minutes when you've only got two people. Um, but the, the most obvious things to point out with what we're watching here is that you are all talking as though there's some sustainable aspect of using up the reserves and moving forward with the hope of getting more state or federal money when we don't have that hope because of everything that this county has chosen to do, shutting down our local businesses, et cetera, despite our uh, virtual non-existent problem with COVID-19. You have successfully kept people afraid that they we might develop a problem, but that doesn't change the fact that we still have no problem with COVID-19, coronavirus, et cetera. And all of the real budget issues pushing that the lowest paid members of the um, county employment be on furlough while the people making the most money are not on furlough it should be a great topic of conversation, of course, and to be talking about what can actually be done to shift our attention in this county to better choices for this county. Since counties can act on their own separate from the state, they're just guidelines from the state based on things happening in Los Angeles, an incredibly different demographic and um, area than the kind that we live in. And again, without the same focus on health and great uh, access to the environment, which is what really heals most people of most things, gardening and eating what we grow in our gardens. So I, I wish you would actually have the kinds of fighting about what to really do about the budget at this point, instead of just passing anything with um, the idea that this makes sense, since it doesn't make sense in the short run or the long run to go with the kinds of choices that you've already been making. Please have the conversation and fight that we need to hear you have on behalf of us all. And Chair, that is it for public comment. Uh, thank you. And I, I just don't answer these things, but you know, the implication that the highest paid are not taking a hit on this uh, department heads, supervisors and so forth are taking a 10% cut. Uh, that's been clear from the start. So uh, not that we're heroes, uh, but I just, uh, it's, it's uh, incorrect to say that those at the top of the ladder, so to speak, no matter what the terminology was, are not taking Part of the hit here. That doesn't mean we're not spending as much time as we ever have on the business of the day, but uh, I think that needs to be uh, spelled out. Um, are there any other closing comments from the uh, board members before we uh, we uh, file and accept this report? Yes, Mr. Chair, I, I wasn't quite given an opportunity, so I'll, I'll speak very briefly. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, no, no apologies. It's difficult in this this environment, but. Um, I, I just wanted to, first I wanted to thank Christina for her presentation as always, very thorough, very helpful, very transparent. And I did want to express a similar to concern to Supervisor Coonerty's in regards to um, ensuring that our contingencies and, and also what Supervisor McPherson said and, and Supervisor Caput ensuring that our reserves are built back up. Now recognizing that, that we as a board made these decisions under an emergency capacity that, to reduce both of those. Uh, but realistically, I think that as funds start to come back in, we have a responsibility to build those both back up, um, if nothing else, because uh, our bond rating requires it on the reserve side. And we just happen to be very fortunate so far, at least, that we've had a dry winter as other downstream issues in regards to droughts, but uh, in regards to our need on some of the other contingency funding. But there's really no question as somebody who experienced the brunt of the over $120 million in storm damage that occurred just a couple of years ago that we need to have funding in these contingencies for these emergency repairs. We have very aging infrastructure and it just makes sense. The one element of good news, and in fact, there was even an announcement uh, today on this and uh, on Friday, I'm uh, gonna be a part of a National Association of Counties um, discussion in regards to this. Uh, apparently the future now majority leader, Senator Schumer did 
uh, announced to his caucus that he wants his first order of business to be an additional stimulus package that includes state and local funding. So I, I do, uh, there really is no justification um, considering the House has passed a couple versions of this, that this new Senate and the new administration wouldn't support it. Just obviously the size and scope will matter, hopefully at that point, but, but well before the February uh, update that we get from, from uh, Ms. Mowry, we'll have a sense of that so we can have some sense of also prioritizing where those funds go because it, depending upon the size and scope, it could actually really help provide a greater, greater clarity of what we can do with reserves, contingencies, and as well as ensuring that our employees um, can get back to fully doing the work of the community. But I just wanted to appreciate that. I will move uh, the recommended actions as well, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I have a second from Supervisor Coonerty, I believe it was. Um, Please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. And Chair McPherson. Aye. You know, normally we have a break, uh, you know, 1030 or 1045, but I think we're moving along fine. And I think if we're doing this virtually, I, I just as soon move on. Uh, unless anybody would uh, definitely need to take a break. I think it's best that we just move forward. Okay, we'll move on to item number nine to consider the third biannual progress report on the Santa Cruz County operational plan for fiscal 2019 to 21. Consider themes and provide guidance for the 21-23 operational plan and direct the County Administrative Office to return in May 2021 with the proposed plan for 21-23 and June 2021 with the final report for 2019-21 as outlined in the memorandum of the County Administrative Officer. Uh, we have a Vision Santa Cruz County presentation, I believe. I don't know if Sven uh, or who is going to make that presentation. Uh, Chair McPherson, Nicole Coburn, Assistant oh, CEO. Thank you. Oh, it's okay. I, I am joined by Sven Stafford, the principal an analyst in our office, who's working with me on the operational plan update. So good morning, Board of Supervisors. Um, we're here today to give you our third update on the current two-year operational plan, which covers the fiscal years of 2019 through 2021. Um, we're going to provide a brief overview and some background, and then we'll move into the updates that we're here to present today, as well as the development process for coming forward with our new two-year operational plan for fiscal years 2021 through 2023. Um, and then we'll wrap up with the recommended actions. So with that, we'll move on. Thank you, Sven. Um, so this diagram shows the interconnectedness of our major man management initiatives, which we started about three years ago. Um, at the top, we have our strategic plan, which the board adopted. Um, that was our, the first initiative that was underway. And then we followed that up with the operational plan, um, as well as Primo process improvement. The, the two-year operational plan, the first of the three that we're bringing to the board was approved in June 30th of 2019. And that really serves as the blueprint for achieving the county's strategic plan and is founded in our vision, vision mission and values. Uh, that plan contains 55 strategies and 180 objectives for achieving our strategic plan. And so I'm going to now turn it over to Sven, who's going to give you um, a high level summary of our updates. Thanks, Nicole. Um, so I'm gonna do the update through the website. So hopefully everyone can see the, um, the Santa Cruz Kachidi plan website that I'm sharing. Um, the, the dynamic sort of layout to the operational plan is still is still maintained. As Nicole said, we have 180 objectives. Uh, 64 of those have been completed. 60 are in progress. Uh, 49 have been amended, and seven have been withdrawn. Um, so, what's new for this update? Uh, in the in the June update uh, of 2020, we put a a COVID impacted hat on 61 objectives. Um, 
just to, to handle the uncertainty of the moment and how it would impact our work. Uh, we've gone back and reviewed those 61 objectives and put them back into the, their normal categories of either completed in progress and on time and amended. Um, we've also uh, added a last category of withdrawn objectives. And so if we sort the objectives here by completion status, um, we can see the, um, the group of seven withdrawn objectives here at the bottom. Um, if you open up one, such as the cannabis merger, uh, we have a little information box here that provides more detail on why the objective was withdrawn. Um, for most of these, it has to do with impacts of COVID and the fire. Um, this one in particular is withdrawn due to, you know, reconsidering whether the merging with the planning department will lead to the program efficiencies we originally thought. And this particular objective is going to be reconsidered for the 21-23 plan. Um, and so I'd like to um, I'd like to take take you through some of the other highlights from the uh, the completed plan. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, the county administrative office and the 2020 census. Um, so just as a reminder for all completed objectives, we're trying to provide verification link or documentation. Uh, so if we open up this link, it takes you to the census site where you can see that the uh, county did have a 71.7 self-response rate for the 2020 census. Um, the next uh, objective that I'd like to highlight for everyone is in our human services department, uh, an objective on food access. Uh, so the department set the objective of increasing by 50% the number of low-income seniors and disabled single adults enrolled in CalFresh, um, getting greater access to, to people who have an entitlement to those benefits. Uh, as you can see from the report provided by Human Services here, uh, they actually increased that um, by well over 50%. Um, the, the actual number was about 100. 158 percent of their of their target uh, with about over 7600 individuals enrolled in that program um, over the baseline of 2018. Uh, the next program I'd like to highlight is from the agricultural commissioner. Uh, their staff set out a target of reducing uh, their fleet greenhouse gas emissions by 10 percent over a two-year period. Um, they were able to do this by uh, over two times that amount. Um, the overall reduction, uh, as you can see here, was about 27% or over 42,000 pounds of carbon uh, that didn't get emitted into the atmosphere. Um, and the final objective that I'd like to, to highlight comes from the district attorney uh, and their neighborhood courts program. Uh, again, it's a restorative justice program that uh, has been um, initiated by the district attorney uh, and in partnership with all our criminal justice partners. Uh, and folks can uh, tour the website and get information on, on how to volunteer and, and participate in that really um, cool program. Uh, so that's the, the update on the current operational plan. I am going to bring it back to the slideshow and talk about the upcoming two-year operational plan for fiscal years 2021 to 23. Um, obviously, the COVID pandemic and the August complex fires um, posed extraordinary challenges to um, our community over the past 12 months. Uh, and so this, this next two-year plan is really viewing um, the development of new objectives as an opportunity to create a foundation for long-term recovery and transformation. Um, and so I'm going to go through a couple of those opportunities in terms of specifically of the fire of COVID and then, um, and then the implementation timeline. Uh, so for fire recovery, um, you know, the fire was our worst natural, natural disaster since the 89 earthquake. Um, Recovery is not simply about uh, rebuilding the over 900 houses that were destroyed. Um, it, uh, it includes 
improvements to public infrastructure and evacuation routes. It includes appropriate uh, mental health and community supports for survivors. Um, and it obviously includes planning for resiliency in the face of uh, future fires and impacts from climate change. Um, on the slide, you can see the six buckets of, um, of typical recovery operations. Um, those will obviously be embedded in our new uh, office of uh, recovery and resiliency. Um, specific objectives that we'll be looking to develop in terms of uh, in terms of that recovery plan and setting the foundation will be you know applying for hazard mitigation grants and identifying funding that we can bring into the community. Um, working working more closely with the community um, and developing a long uh, a long term recovery group. Um, really working on our uh, permit performance measures to make sure that. Um, folks who are rebuilding are able to do so efficiently and then um, you know providing counseling and mental health services to make sure that we're uh, taking care of the human aspect of, of the recovery as well. In terms of uh, COVID-19 um, the pandemic has obviously changed the the nature of our lives and our work. Um, recovery from this uh, will be challenging and um, especially to ensure that everyone can adapt and that we uh, are creating more resiliency, especially for those communities that were disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. Um, for the 2021-23 operational plan, we want to build on the work of the County Health Services Agency and their uh, Save Lives Santa Cruz County program. Um, the, the acronym of SAVE is uh, slow the spread, adapt and adjust, vaccinate and treat, and elevate readiness. Uh, specific objectives that we're, we'll be working on with departments uh, in terms of COVID-19 recovery include um, enhancing county remote work policies, uh, making sure that people um, accessing our services are able to do so in a safe way, uh, equitable distribution of uh, COVID-19 vaccines, and then economic recovery. And so uh, with that, I'll pass it back to Nicole to talk about the implementation timeline and improvements. Thanks, Sven. So as we move forward uh, to develop our new two-year operational plan, we wanted to give you an idea of where we've been and where we're going um, as part of that process. So last month in December, we held a training with departments on measurement. Um, we were trying to get them familiar again with our results-based accountability framework in which we're trying to answer three questions. Um, how much did we do? How well did we do? And is anyone better off? Um, the objectives that are in the first two-year operational plan, um, we're working towards achieving the RBA framework, um, but it was definitely a learning process and um, not everyone was as familiar with it. So um, we've been uh, working on training them to get them back up to speed and but with the goal of having the new objectives and the new plan much more closely align with that sort of framework. Um, today, um, we're here to present our development process for the new two-year operational plan. Um, we've presented some themes and we'd also like to hear from you and gather your guidance on what you would like to see in the, in the new two-year operational plan. Um, you had previously requested this opportunity to provide earlier guidance to staff, and so um, we're, we're hoping that this achieves that. Later this month in January, we have a training with departments on embedding equity in the new objectives, and that will be followed up by some written instructions to departments on how to write their objectives. Um, we have a February workshop uh, that we'll be scheduling or a series of workshops that we'll be scheduling with departments to bring them together to talk about objectives that might overlap or um, to brainstorm and think through what, what we might put into the new two-year plan. In March, um, on March 5th, uh, objectives will be due from a department and then we will start a process of reviewing, editing, and aligning those objectives um, we do need to work closely with departments to make sure that objectives that are being drafted are, um, are, can be completed, that there's capacity and resources 
as well as um, they are relevant to any themes or other key issues that the board might have. Um, we'll be discussing draft objectives with relevant groups, whether they be advisory bodies or commissions or others. And then in May, we plan to pr present the proposed new tutor operational plan to the board to get the board's feedback and make any revisions that are necessary before we bring the final plan to the board in June for adoption. Um, so just to recap some of the improvements that we want to see in the new two-year operational plan, we're hoping one, that objectives more closely use measurement and baselines and more closely tied to our RBA framework. Um, we're hoping that objectives also address some of um, any disparities that might exist and We'll be working with departments to uh, get them to develop at least one objective that addresses a specific disparity that might lead to more equitable results. And then we're also hoping that it reflects any board input that we received today. Um, so in conclusion, um, our recommended actions are to accept and file the third biannual progress report on the current operational plan. Um, we also ask the board to consider themes and provide guidance on developing the new two-year operational plan, and then to direct our office to return in May with the proposed plan for the new two-year period, and then to re return in June with the final report for the current operational plan of uh, fiscal years 2019 through 2021. And so with that, Sven and I are happy to answer your questions um, and or you know, address any other issues. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, great presentation. Uh, and I, I think it's, um, I just want to thank the uh, CEO's office and the whole uh, county team for working together on this. We had employees to uh, take, spend hours and hours, more than two years ago to, to establish this plan. And if the general public wants to get an idea of where our where are our priorities and where we're going, this is a great place to start. I'll tell you, it then it gives us uh, some real good ideas of where where we want to go in the immediate future and the long term future. <clears throat> and I, I think it's very impressive that we have met uh, we have two thirds or more of our objectives, uh, either have done them or they're in progress. So congrat congratulations to them all. Um, we'll get some comments from the board members, uh, Supervisor Koenig. Yeah, I just uh, also wanted to express my thanks for this entire process for the CAO's uh, office, uh, really, you know, helping make sure we have, uh, you know, these, these long-term objectives um, to guide our work. And it's been a great opportunity for me to dive into the specific strategies uh, and goals and objectives um, to, to you know, hear a reflection of the community's values uh, and you know, match them up against some of the priorities I heard uh, throughout the campaign. Um, in reviewing some of the objectives, I just wanted to make sure, um, you know, some are clearer than others as far as you know, being sort of discreet and measurable. Um, and I wanna make sure that we're not uh, with the tasks that are um, associated with an objective to accomplish that objective. You know, let's make sure we're not kind of creating uh, objectives within objectives. Um, you know, so I can, one example I came across was, uh, I believe it was number 176 about the syringe services program. Uh, and it included several, uh, within the tasks, um, it included, for example, a walkthrough of the program um, with, uh, the, I think, the California uh, Department of Health. Um, and then one of the last tasks was establish uh, a commission for the syringe services program. And so in being completed, it's unclear, well, did the last task get completed or did all of the tasks get completed? Um, so, you know, and even if, even if all of them did get completed, I think the more discreet each objective is, the, the better. Um, I have a number of um, proposed additions uh, for, for new objectives. I don't know if now is a good time to uh, propose those or if uh, we wanted to turn it over to the public first uh, and other supervisors for questions. I'm, I'm open for, to either. Ms. Coburn, how, would, how do you think that could be addressed uh, under the, the way we've been doing it and maybe have, can improve on it? Do you, would you like him to submit those to you off yeah, if uh, Supervisor Koenig has direction for staff, we're happy to take that. And if you want to incorporate that into a motion, um, you know, as part of this 
action, that would be fine. Um, we will take that input and utilize it as we move forward with developing new objectives with departments. Okay, I'll incorporate uh, that into a motion uh, maybe after public comment. Okay, I, I don't know if you just, in general, do you, do you want to just say uh, in general a couple of points that you, you were interested in just for curiosity? There might be some uh, interest in the public or the other supervisors too, uh, just very briefly. Hmm, okay. Um, <laughs> sure. Well, um, let's see. So, so one of the uh, inclusions I, I would like to move to give staff direction to develop an additional objective uh, related to 1D1. So that's comprehensive health and safety, behavioral health, uh, and expediting access to behavioral health services. And the specific objective I'd like to propose uh, is to contract with a mental health first response unit similar to Eugene, Oregon's CAHOOTS program and available via 911 for crisis involving mental illness, homelessness, and addiction. Okay, that's a good example. Thank you. Just wanted to get a sense of sure. one of those. And I, um, I, I do think I, well, myself that uh, to, to include the, the issue of equity uh, in this day and age, especially this year and age, uh, it's very important. And I think we've already taken some moves in that direction. Uh, Supervisor Friend. Um, thank you, Chair. And I, I was going to actually make a very similar comment. The flexibility of introduction of equity into the metrics was very important and appreciated for Mr. Stafford and Ms. Coburn over the last, um, I guess, about nine months when, when some of these discussions were coming up right in the middle of a pandemic as well. So I appreciated that. Um, I, I don't have a lot of commentary in general. I mean, we, we spent a lot of time introduce, I mean, a lot of time creating this process. I will say uh, for Supervisor Koenig, I am interested in hearing specifically what he wants to propose because we went through a really significant public outreach process and creation of these objectives. And so I would be a little bit concerned just simply adding additional direction on to modify our operation plan without a broader discussion on it. I mean. Uh, for example, the CAHOOTS program, I've done some reading on it, but if it becomes sort of a county policy uh, right here with a quick direction, that seems like um, that do it does a disservice to what we did to create this plan because we had a lot of things that we cut down, as you may recollect, through the public outreach processes that occurred in each district and through the many, 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 many public hearings we had as well as staff outreach discussions we had on this. So. I imagine all of the objectives that are going to be added on might be good ideas, but this, but I think that it, it may be a little, in my opinion, it may be a little, I, I need to hear feedback from our health director as to whether that's feasible. I need to hear, I mean, so maybe these are instead of directions to actually modify, it's direction to come back with more information about from staff about whether these can be incorporated in or not. I'm sort of a broader discussion than just the additional direction. Okay, we'll take them. But I, but I feel like Supervisor Koenig should have that opportunity because he was not on the board at that time and his values and, and what he, his interests should absolutely be incorporated into a future operation plan. It just, I don't know, uh, this seems we're a little quick to just simply add to modify our plan right now as a result of a, a lack, you know, this, this quickly. Okay. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, understandable. Uh, uh, Supervisor Koenig? Yeah, um, well, first, let me just, Big picture, and then I want to get to I think the the issue that Supervisor Friend and Coding have, have raised. So the first big picture is let me just say I mean I, the way that the county staff has responded during multiple crises this year, um, and uh, not only a pandemic and economic crisis, a reckoning on racial justice, and then fires, and then that two thirds of these goals um, that we asked them to make these make these goals, uh, you know, stretch goals uh, for our county. I have never been prouder uh, to be associated with the county and the work that's been done. Um, and I think going through this, is, uh, it's, been a, it's been a wonderful exercise to remind us all of the breadth and scope and important work that's being done on a daily basis. Um, on a process question that sort of goes to the previous conversation, uh, you know, I think that the board uh, needs to play a role in both setting and then amending and or uh, deleting these plans. It's it's really difficult to do in this context uh, of a meeting uh, for the reasons the supervisor friend outlined. Um, the additional direction that I'd add 
that I was pointing out anyway, but I think may solve uh, this issue because I think supervisor coding should should be able to weigh in and we all should weigh in is that um, to, is to direct that staff uh, at a direction uh, to this item that staff meet with each board office beginning at least one month prior to when the plan is to return in in May in order to work with board members to develop new objectives or to provide guidance on remaining objectives and amended, amended objectives. In addition, before any operational plan objectives are amended or withdrawn from the plan, the staff will notify the board by memo outlining the amended and withdrawn objectives with explanations. I mean, I think the key here is that these are, as, as Supervisor Friend mentioned, these are, we're engaging in trade-offs um, for many of the objectives that I'm interested in, it's all about the details, um, and uh, we really need to have that. And then the staff needs to uh, hear the objectives up from the departments, and hopefully from the all the way from the line level staff, line level staff up to the department heads. But then needs to try to hear each board member's concerns and see what see where there's overlap or where there's conflict and then bring it to the board where we can discuss and evaluate it. Um, but it's hard to do in, in this context. So um, I'm, I'd add that direction um, as a way to hopefully, uh, you know, um, allow us to move forward today, but also give us a, a way for all board members to engage on this plan going forward. That understand so clearly by the clerk then? Yes, uh, Supervisor Dappet. You bet. Uh, I want to thank staff for the report also, and uh, and uh, with uh, Supervisor Koenig's uh, uh, suggest, uh, you know, uh, mentioning adding or something to the uh, plan right now. Uh, I think to get the ideas out there and then have public input on it and then more you know staff input would be good but uh to hear his ideas and then uh try to put it in the, in the future into the uh into the plan would be a good idea so uh, the other thing is uh we're going through really trying times and i'm very proud of the staff and uh, board of supervisors it's been an honor to serve with you during this uh, multiple crisis year. I think the, the key thing that we've been looking at is we have our budget. Uh, it's not so bad because we did have a reserve. Uh, we did get a lot of federal money. We got a lot of state money. Uh, my biggest concern is though, we can be in top shape as far as the county. But what we have to worry about is the people that have lost their businesses, lost their livelihoods uh, during the crisis. Uh, maybe they didn't have a reserve. Maybe they didn't have uh, the help they needed when they needed it the most. So uh, as good as our county budget might be projected, uh, it doesn't compare to the uh, hardship and the trials that the people we represent are going through right now. So what I'm getting at is we need to help uh, build up all of the people that pay our taxes in, and uh, all the people in, you know, that are, that are paying for everything that we're doing. And that's my number one concern. And especially the, uh, you know, the underprivileged, the ones that never had much money in the beginning, uh, we got to make sure that they get more money so that they can pay their rent, they can pay for their food, they pay for their PG&E costs and everything. So uh, anyway, we're, we're, we're heading in the right direction for the county, but I think we need to have more input and uh, from the public and concentrate on the people that are really uh, facing bankruptcy or they're facing uh, financial uh, hardship that they cannot overcome without our help. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'd like to make one, um, you know, as it pertains to the future operational objectives, um, how will we collect public input? I mean, is there a dateline and would you probably want to get this online or 
or by through the mail or something, uh, uh, Ms. Colburn. Uh, yeah. Is there a dateline you want this by? I can't. I don't have that chart in front of me of the dateline, but if we want public input, uh, listen to public. This is where we are, and this is where we're going. So this is your time to be involved and make suggestions. So how would how would they best get that done? So over the next few months, you know, we're going to be um, working with departments to initially draft the, some objectives. And then we will be seeking whether we go to commissions like we did with the last plan or come to other public settings, you know, there will likely be opportunities to provide some input. Um, when we present the proposed plan to the board in May, that will coincide with the proposed budget. And um, subsequent to that, either at that meeting or through budget hearings, there would be an opportunity for the public to weigh in on everything that's been proposed before we finalize it at the end of June. So there will be a series of points during which the public or commissions um, or others who are key stakeholders can weigh in on what, on what we've put together for the board. And I'll just a point of clarification regarding um, some of the other questions that came up. Uh, we're asking for feedback right now for the new two-year operational plan. We're not suggesting making further amendments to the current operational plan. Um, most of what's been amended in the current operational plan has to do with impacts from um, COVID-19 and the fire. And so we've, we've made some adjustments to timelines, but um, we're, we're really looking um, forward and hoping that we receive any guidance from you so that when we start to work with departments, we know how to direct their efforts and can help um, you know, work on different objectives that might be of interest to the board. Very good, thank you. Um, uh, clerk, is there, are there any, uh, is there any input from the pu public? Any questions? Chair, I do not, oh, hold on. There is one hand up. Okay, we do have one hand up. If you give me one second, I will share my screen. <laughs> oh. Okay, caller whose telephone number ends in 2915. You will have two minutes to speak. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and start speaking. Once you do so, the timer will start. Thank you. This is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, I lost uh, internet here for a while, so I'm, I had to leave the meeting, but am now back and have just kind of come in in the middle of this report. I, I remember that from earlier reports, there was a dashboard that was supposed to be available to the public. And I did look at that, and it was supposed to show these measurable exact actions that met the uh, vision. And I never really saw it functioning. So I would like clarification in terms of uh, public input in moving forward. How will that dashboard really be made um, functional? and available to the public. Um, I want to speak about the fire recovery and um, operational excellence. I have been very concerned that this county um, eliminated the emergency services manager position, full-time paid position. Um, the supervisors were to come with a plan to uh, possibly fund that position with jurisdictional input and I never have seen that happen. What I have seen happen is a completely new department started up, the Office of Resiliency, and hiring a new person. And today we see that pay could be anywhere from 65 to $87 an hour, but no real clarification about what this job would be. I also know that um, the person that had been the assistant to the the manager was transferred over to the CAO's office and is not one of the three people that is being hired to assist this new person. I feel like operationally, this is uh, really disconnected. It will leave our county in peril for um, when we really need to have the relationships established. And Chair,
Yes. I do not see any further hands up, so that would be the end of public comment on this item. Okay. Um, I'd uh, like to have a motion to accept and file this report. I think somebody who wanted to make that motion did. Uh, yeah, I can. I can. Uh, Mr. Chair, this is Ryan Coonerty. I'll, I can make the motion. Um, and I mean, I think Supervisor Coning as a, as a new supervisor should meet with staff to walk through uh, any and all proposals as we all should. But um, I would add the additional direction that staff meet with each board member beginning at least one month prior to when the plan returns in May uh, and to, to develop new objectives and provide guidance on remaining objectives and amended objectives. And then in addition, before any operational plan, objectives are amended or withdrawn from the plan, the staff notify the board by memo outlining the amended and withdrawn objectives with, with an explanation. Uh, I'll, uh, Supervisor Caput, I'll second that. And uh, also if we can get more public input, uh, we've got to figure out how to do that virtually and everything. We got it. We'll, we're moving that direction because we have to. Yeah. Uh, that's our directive right now. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, um, Chair, yeah. I would ask before I call for a roll if uh, Supervisor Coonerty could please email the clerk of the board your um, additional direction. That would be great. I will do. Thank you. I'll now call roll. Yes. Supervisor Koenig. Supervisor. You're mute. muted. Sorry, uh, <laughs> I was on mute. Uh, I'll say I. I just wanted to add um, that I'm, I will send uh, in written form some of the proposals I had uh, to uh, Ms. Coburn and um, for opportunity to review those. And um, also look forward to working with the public uh, to review the objectives, uh, specifically in the first district when they come out. Supervisor Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. Chair McPherson. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, we will go to item number 10 to consider the final appointment of Cheryl Dortier. Uh, I hope that's correct. I'm sorry if it's not. To the Commission on Justice and Gender as an at large representative of the Black African community, uh, American community, for a term to expire April 1st, 2024. The nomination was accepted on uh, December 8th. 2020. Any discussion? Uh, any, any comments from the public? There is no public comment, Chair. Okay. Uh, entertain well, a motion. Well, I'll move to approve. Second. Second. Motion to second to uh, uh, to approve the final appointment uh, on item number ten. Uh, please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. Chair McPherson? Aye. We will move to item number 11 to consider the final reappointment of Thomas John Batley to the Commission uh, the Community Action Board as an at-large county representative for a term to expire January 6, 2025. This nomination also was accepted on December 8, 2020. Any comments from the public? I see no pu um, public comments. And I, I don't, I don't think I see any coming from uh, from the board. Uh, we'll entertain a motion and a second. I'll move to approve, Supervisor Caput. Second, Coonerty. Coonerty, uh, Caput, Coonerty, please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. And Chair McPherson. Aye. That motion is approved unanimously. Uh, item number 12, the final item, uh, regular agenda item of the day, consider the final reappointment of Larry Pegler to the Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District Board of Directors as an at-large general community member representative for a term to expire December 31st, 2024. This nomination was accepted on December 8th, 2020. Any, com uh, any comments uh, from board members? Any comments from the public? There are no public comments. Thank you, Chair. I will entertain a motion and uh, second. Move of approval for Coonerty. Coonerty moves. Do I have a second? 
I'll second it. <laughs> if I can do that as chair, okay. Uh, we're moved and seconded. Please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Excuse me, friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. And Chair McPherson. Aye. That motion uh, passes unanimously. We are now uh, ready to go into uh, closed session. Um, Mr. Um, Heath, uh, County Council, are there any reportable items? There are no reportable items today. Okay. Are there any comments from the public on items that are on our closed agenda, our closed session agenda? I see no public comment. Okay. Uh, it is now just after 12 o'clock. We will take a 10 minute break and uh, meet at 1215 in closed session. We will adjourn this uh, public meeting. Thank you.